Oh, okay, there we go. Thumbs up Good now. evening, and welcome to the May 7th meeting of the Ames Community School District Board. Directors, I'll, I'll take a approval for the agenda. So moved. Second. Moved by Perez, seconded by Rosser. Discussion? All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Passes 6-0. Director Colton, will you please read the mission statement? The mission of the Ames Community Schools is to ensure that all learners develop the knowledge, skills, attitudes, values, and personal esteem necessary to grow in and shape a changing society. Thank you very much. This is my <laughs> annual time <laughs> where um, I get to recognize the Ames Board of Education as board members are being recognized across the state. May is um, Board Member Appreciation Month. And I think it's uh, one of those situations where board members who are locally elected, they're non-salaried, uh, and they're entrusted really with the task of trying to, prevent, uh, trying to actually uh, provide direction for the education of students uh, across Iowa. And today, public schools across, uh, as I said, across the state are recognizing this as Board Member Appreciation Month. And while they are good stewards in the investment uh, that they are putting in, they also put in an amazing amount of time that a lot of people don't realize. Uh, each week and sometimes every day, uh, they donate their personal time for the service for Ames kids. And this being the month of May and School Board Recognition Month, it's really an opportunity for local schools and communities to honor more than 2,000 individuals who serve as board members and are dedicated to children in schools across the state of Iowa. Personally, I'm very proud of this board and the dedicated volunteers that are here. And I really personally want to thank them for your service and the time that you put in. I know how much time that you put in. And I know how much you care about kids. And that's really what we're basically all about. It's really one of the toughest volunteer positions that you can ever have. And so thank you for your service to Ames and in your reward, suitable for framing. <laughs> it's a certificate from, from the Iowa Association of School Boards and it says, I believe in public education and school board recognition month. Thank you for your service to Iowa public schools. So thank you, board member. If thank you would you. please submit me. <laughs> All right, we will go ahead and move on to discussion items and I will read our statement on discussion items. <coughs> Residents of the district, students attending the district, parents or guardians of students attending the district, and district staff members may address the board about any topic relevant to the district, whether on the current agenda or not. Those who wish to speak must sign up at the beginning of the meeting. Speaker participation is limited to three minutes once per item. The views and opinions of citizens addressing the board do not necessarily reflect those of the board, district administration, or staff. Speakers are to remember that Iowa law prohibits the board from discussing specific employees, students, or their performance. Student speakers will state their name in school. Others will state their name and address. And our first item is policies to announce. Dr. Banken. So uh, at... Uh, um Former Director Briggs' last meeting, he and I met to review six policies that were up for review, the first of which was the evaluation of the superintendent. We decided that it was probably better to hold off on that policy until we could meet as a board. The remaining five were reviewed, uh, minor changes, I believe for the... Um, the hazardous chemical risk, there were no changes at all. Support staff substitutes, there were simply some changes to address outdated language, nothing really substantial. Um, and in terms of student teaching, practicum, and internships, the change to the policy was really just made. Um, we, there was language added about requiring a, a national background check. It was policy in the district, but, or it was something we had been doing, but it wasn't anything that was codified in the policy, and so we made that change. And then there was a change in the policy that just is reflective of a change in the administrative rules about who would be supervising those particular internships. 
And then as might be of interest to this particular board, there is an updated policy on the names on building plaques. So uh, there is an official policy about whose names from the school board um, and the administration go on plaques for buildings that are built. And I believe there are plaques that need to be placed on every new building. Is that right, Jerry? Five ele elementary, the high school, the admin building, and the facilities building, I believe, is what we're planning on. Um, and then uh, just... Uh, some editing to the playground specifications, nothing minor, nothing major was changed. And then just some uh, changing in language to the administrative rules that would be sure that our, any um, playground facilities we built were, of course, in line with the current legal requirements. Nothing major, just stuff that would keep us all out of trouble. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. I just, I just have a question. clarification question regarding the naming of building plaques. Mm -hmm. This is commonly a um, question that um, people in community have about how does that all work? Um, so just to clarify, so the members of the, the superintendent and the board members that, um, and secretary and treasurer of the board, um, that will be named on a, any particular building, one that when the referendum passes, or when the funding is approved by the board. So for example, when we <clears throat> passed funding um, for um, the, um, this building, the board members at that time, superintendent at that time was such, if we put up a name plaque, that's whose name would go on it. Whereas for the high school, correct if I'm wrong here, Jerry, <laughs> it, and, and <clears throat> Dr. Binken, if the interpretation is that for the referendum, then those that were on the board at the time um, and the superintendent and such forth would be those names on the plaque, correct? That is correct. Okay. And it's not a change, actually. It's been the existing correct. policy. Yeah. That's correct. It's been the exact mm -hmm. existing policy for, for quite I a while. I think 2003 is when it was adopted. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So if there's any questions or comments from the uh, public, certainly uh, submit them to Dr. Taylor. And as uh, is our process, this will move to, um, this is the first reading of these policies. So it will appear again in our, our next meeting. So are there any comments from the public on these policies that have been announced tonight? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and move on to item five, middle school science resources early announcement. Ari Smith and gang. Kari Smith and I'm the math and science teacher on special assignment for the district. Tonight I am joined by um, some sixth and seventh grade science teachers. This is Mary Glenn, seventh grade science, Michelle Andrews, sixth grade science, Rebecca Bowman, sixth grade science, Lisa Green, sixth grade science, Carrie Marsh, seventh grade science, and then Aaron Barr is one of the instructional coaches at Ames Middle School. In August of 2015, there were new science standards adopted by the Department of Education. We refer to those as the Iowa Science Standards, and they are adapted from the Next Generation Science Standards, or NGSS. At the time that they were adopted, there was a four-year implementation plan laid out by the state um, with K-12 implementation by next year, the 2018-2019 academic year. These teachers that you see um, have been engaged in several trainings provided by Heartland AEA, as well as local science experts um, in the community, as well as through Iowa State. They worked really hard to unpack the new standards, design labs, and hands-on investigations to help them best meet the intent of NGSS. Additionally, these teachers reviewed many text resources to help support the standards and content in their classroom. 
The chosen textbooks will be just one of many resources that will be used in these courses. As part of the review process, the teachers made sure that a wide range of cultures and ethnicities were represented. International as well as local issues were presented. We know that we still have work to do in regards to the cultural competency piece, and teacher, these teachers will be engaged in cultural competency training with Dr. Spikes and Swalwell next year. And throughout that process, the curriculum and scope and sequences can be reviewed and revised as their learning and understanding of the cultural competency piece um, grows. Because these teachers have invested a considerable amount of time in preparing themselves to teach these standards, I'd like them to um, have a chance to tell a bit about the work that they've done, as well as to justify their reasonings for the um, text resources that they would like to purchase. That'll feel weird. Okay, so um, I'm Michelle Andrews. I teach sixth grade science at the middle school, and we have started it was probably two or three years ago, where, um, as Kari had mentioned, just beginning to unpack those standards, get a better understanding um, of what those were. And sixth grade is kind of an unusual grade level in that we seem to have our feet dipping in two different dimensions. We are secondary, but we're also elementary. <laughs> so we've done quite a bit of work. Um, we spent first initially working with Eileen Sullivan through the high school just to get a better understanding of the content or the DCIs. And then we worked with the Heartland Area Education Agency going through the module trainings that they've provided throughout the state for all science teachers. And then most recently we've been working closely with Jan Verhoeven, um, really working on making science, I guess, come alive in our classrooms so that the kids really saw themselves as scientists, which they already do, so I'm not sure that was really all that hard. <laughs> uh, and then we, like I said, we began working on taking a look at resources that we could use. And this year was really our first year of full implementation of the Next Generation Science Standards. Um, do you want me to talk about why we've chosen our book at this time, or do you want me to wait until? I think you can talk. Okay. Um, so with the work that we had done with Heartland, with um, Jen Verhoeven, and uh, with Eileen, really kind of the key thing we wanted to take a look at was the areas of pedagogy when we were looking at the textbooks, as well as taking a look at the nature of science and engineering. And we wanted to make sure that any supplemental resources that they provided would really be of a great benefit to us. Um, we chose to, uh, we would like to recommend the adoption of the McGraw-Hill textbook. Uh, in terms of the pedagogy, we really felt as a team that it provided a rigorous coverage of those sixth grade next generation science standards in terms of the engineering practices, the disciplinary core ideas, um, as well as the cross-cutting concepts. They provided an alignment guide here for us in order to make finding those, I don't know, does this even show up? Probably not, but who cares. Um, it provides an alignment guide, allows us to know where the standard is, because Iowa was so gracious in taking the next generation science standards and making them different. So they kind of dealt them out like a deck of cards. And so most textbooks, you're going to find some of our standards in one book, you'll find another standard provided in the second book, and then another standard's provided in the third book. So what we liked about McGraw-Hill is they provided a way for us to easily find those, and um, as well as making it easy for the kids to find them. Through our training with Heartland and with Yen, really a key thing in terms of our science education is the 5E model. And that's where we have the students engage, explore, they explain, they extend, and they evaluate their learning. That's clearly incorporated throughout this text. Um, it also provides us a strand map that's going to give you the background knowledge that the children are required to have and how each standard begins to meld and blend into the next one. Um, there's differentiated instruction clearly incorporated for approaching level, on level, and then even beyond level. Uh, we also really liked that it has uh, formative assessments embedded throughout. When we're talking science education, Paige Keeley is a huge name, and she's been working with McGraw-Hill, and so her stuff is already present within the text. And there are a variety of assessments that are traditional, performance-based, project-based, um, lots of ideas to work with there. Um, and then the, the supplemental resources, the textbook is a hybrid. So they would get a hard copy book that we could have in the classroom, as well as an online text. And the online text allows it to be read aloud to the students. 
And what we really liked about this one is the student can actually click specifically where they want it to start reading, and it will begin reading there. If you've ever seen an online text and it says it can read it to you, it starts at the very top of the first page and it reads the whole entire thing. Whereas this one, the kid can choose and pick what they want to have read to them. They're able to highlight, they're able to write, they're able to create their own online notebook so everything can be created. And with McGraw-Hill, you can download an app and the textbook is always accessible to them even if they don't have access to Wi-Fi. They can still at least get to the book itself. So we really liked that as well. Um, and then the teachers are provided with the toolbox in terms of background knowledge and then support. And what we liked also was the support in identifying any misconceptions the student might have and how we might be able to uh, break through those misconceptions. So, is that good? I'm an overachiever, I'm sorry. <laughs> Can I say ditto? No, sorry. <laughs> you can tell I teach middle school. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, the seventh grade size teacher, Carrie and I, we were looking at, at <clears throat> McGraw Hill and also the Pearson, um, Pearson Hall Elevate Science, whatever, and um, books. And Carrie and I felt that we liked the Pearson Elevate Science uh, out of the two a little better. We thought it, it felt to a little more student friendly user kind of thing, uh, for how we liked how the chapters were set up um, from their color coding to their key concepts to uh, all kinds of things. It does a very good job covering all the NGSS standards that we teach. Carrie and I took some time and just, we went through and literally made sure we could find every NGS standard in the, the series of three books that we needed. Uh, they told us where it was at, that kind of thing. Uh, and did a very nice job of that. We really enjoyed the, we really liked the cross-cutting concepts and how they're used throughout the whole series. It helped us with bundling some of those um, NGSS standards together and kind of how they go through. Um, how they were given to us in the state of Iowa, sometimes it was kind of hard to get a common thread. Uh, in years past, we had like say, we could take energy and thread energy all the way through all year long and back and forth different topics. And we, we felt that the Pearson Hall did a, a nice job of helping us with those cross-cutting concepts and feeding them in and out of our life science and our physical science and our earth science uh, things. And then, of course, the other thing we enjoy being science teachers is that hands-on engineering practice stuff and modeling. Um, there's some reading, but always there's some kind of little hands-on activity, some little demo you could do it straight. So maybe we're practicing our reading skills or their science, but we also could um, um, have these lovely hands-on um, engineering things, and then we could either do this traditional test or we could do a project test, project-based uh, activity and, and things like that. And so we really thought the Pearson Hall did a really good job on all those things. Samples of each of these uh, proposed texts will be on display for community review from 8.30 to 3.30 beginning tomorrow through next Monday the 14th. Um, at, those are available here at the district office as well as in the um, student services office at Ames Middle School. Any questions for our staff? I have a couple of questions, actually. So thank you very much. I know this is a very laborious process. Um, I guess my questions are really, I'd like to hear a little bit more about the cultural proficiency. Have, I know, I'm not sure if all the teachers have gone through the training yet. Have that, yeah, that's, so that's coming, so, okay. Mm -hmm. And so in, if we're committing to a text without that training, how long are we locked into this particular text for? Well, like I said, I mean, this text is one of several resources, mm -hmm. um, and we want our teachers to use it, you know, loosely to support the standards and to be pulling several other resources um, that, you know, um, most textbooks are not really culturally sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, and so just them asking them to be, um, as they learn and understand more about the cultural competency to be finding other resources to support this that are going to bring in other scientists from you know other cultures and other races that maybe aren't highlighted in in this particular text 
So I, I actually just wanted to share an experience that I had um, with textbooks. So I hate textbooks. Everybody knows I hate textbooks. There's no such thing as a good textbook, right? If there was a good one, I would use it. And so it really is kind of picking the, the least worst, I, yeah. I feel sometimes, you know? There's, it's hard, right? And so I actually use the online McGraw-Hill textbook in my particular college-level course uh, dealing with criminology. And, uh, you know, a theoretical evidence-based field, and we had to stop using it. It was so... Uh, culturally inappropriate, you know, it was kind of filled with these racial stereotypes that outdated, you know, that kind of stuff. And I guess what I what I ended up doing, because you kind of have to pick and choose, right, is I was able to take the things in there that were really outdated ways of thinking and use them as a, as a teaching moment. And so, because you really can't rid the world of that way of thinking, and so we would actually use that as a lesson. Is that something that potentially might happen with the text that you're using? I'm not familiar with Pearson. I, I'm, I don't know how that is, but is that maybe something that would happen, or would you just skip a chapter? What, how would you, because you can't get rid of all of it. What's your well, thought about right now? This is going to be like Kari has mentioned before, just one component mm -hmm. in everything that we do. Mm -hmm. um, we really look at it as somewhat of a foundation piece to get the agreed upon science, philosophy, teachings, theories, and then we have our open-ended resources. We've been getting instruction in terms of using those open-ended resources, working with Yen. I think one of the key things, it's not so much the textbook as much as it is the teacher that's in the classroom and what the teacher's providing for the student. So just as I was piloting this textbook and we were going through a particular um, lab that we were then doing to support the content, you could hear our students of all genders, races, backgrounds in my classroom going, I want to be a science teacher. I want to be a this or I want to be that. It's, you just have to create that environment within your classroom. Mm -hmm. And what the kids really utilized the resource for was really just either back up their thinking mm -hmm. in terms or, okay, I know sh we talked about this. I know we did this. Where can I find the information? And my students felt they could go back and find the information easily in that text. Okay. So, And I think once we get the training and we start mm -hmm. going through that, we'll be able to make those adaptations and adjustments as we go along. And to my final question is, you're going to make the materials available. Thank you for that. I'm actually interested in looking through them. Would you give guidance about what you want us to kind of look at, or are you asking the community to still get all the books all the way through? Um, there, with the books that are set out, um, it's kind of a material evaluation sheet that mm -hmm. our teachers use mm -hmm. as their sort of screening. Um, you know, they looked at multiple different texts and then decided upon their top two to pilot. Um, so that's just kind of a starting point. Um, I think, I don't have them printed off right now, but um, I can grab them easily. I think um, having a copy of the standards, if you're not familiar with the new standards mm -hmm. and what NGSS is, is really asking. No, I mean like you're going to cover oh, the whole sorry. book or there's just certain chapters. Oh. You, mean you're, you, won't, you mean to teach the Got whole it. book. You go through the whole book. Oh, she's saying no. <laughs> <laughs> there are, at least for seventh grade, there are three courses, and we teach like two topics in each course or something. Okay. Like so there's like ten topics. Okay. Yeah. I see. Um, but because of the way I was shuffled them, we need all three books to hit all the topics. Okay, I understand. Um, but this is, That's okay. this is maybe going to, I don't know, are you going to have an access to the digital? Because the Pearson also has a digital portion to the book. Um, and so I don't know if you're going to have an opportunity to review the digital portions or not. I don't know what you're doing. Um, I think there is kind of a sandbox account for each one that we could have that information available. And then as yeah. far as McGraw-Hill goes, they're actually going to custom make a single textbook for us mm -hmm. that is for our standards. And that what I have done so that as, as a way to guide you in terms of looking at the criteria that has that, I have marked things in here that have in regards to the pedagogy regards to the science and engineering. So things have been marked in here so you can hopefully be able to know what it is that you're looking at. Um, I knew what I was looking for, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the general public knows what they're looking for. So I tried to make sure I marked those things to be present. Thank you. Thank you mm -hmm. for all your work. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Other questions? Um, I have a question. Uh, does Pearson have the uh, assistive technology built in, like McGraw? Held us. You like the, 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 yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. they have a um, they have a read to you section as well. Um, currently, these are um, these books are a true pilot. Like they're not even published yet. So the digital part of the Pearson book isn't quite 
finished yet. So sometimes when you go to hit the read, right now it's not, it's not it wasn't working for the pilot, but they're working on trying to get that to work. In the but they do have a read to you version of that as well, where you push the button. And they have a highlight for their book. Um, they don't necessarily have the uh, app version where you can download it as an app, um, but they do have other ways for you to use the book if you don't have Wi-Fi. I, I'm not sure. I, I believe that, at least I was told, I have not been able to figure out how to do it, but I believe that the, the Pearson book had quite a few different languages you could transfer and have it read to you in the different languages too, but I can't remember, or and I couldn't figure out how to get that one to work when you were piloting, piloting it. Yeah. Um, if it helps you, sorry, um, we have a, at least for the seventh grade, the Pearson book, we have a, um, a chart of our standards and we went through and said, it's this topic, this course, this book. So that next year, when, we're looking, when we wanted to use it, we would know exactly where to look at. We can leave, uh, or I can, I can send it to Kari. Kari can print one and leave it with the book. So you can say, if you want um, the Earth Science Standard, the Solar System Standard, it's topic nine in book three, or something mm -hmm. like that. So you can look for that. That would be helpful. Thank you. No problem. And I think I would like to add to Director Benkin's point. Um, I think once you, for the cultural competency, if you find something that you will like to support, how do you foresee that happening? Do you, I, I guess I would like to see it that all sixth grade teachers do it and all seventh grade, not just one teacher found this awesome plan and they, they don't share it with the rest. I, I like that uniformity for yeah. all the students. Yeah. And that's, I mean, they do uh, meet fairly often as a PLC um, to plan and, and discuss those things. So, you know, I don't think any of those decisions are only made in isolation. They make them as a team. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Kari, you talked to um, meeting with Eileen Sullivan about the connection to high school. I'm curious, what's that connection look like to elementaries? Mm -hmm. So are kids prepared, in your opinions, uh, for this new delivery model? And then what, I guess, what feedback do you have? I could tell you what she told me. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So I was in a panic when I got the new standards. And she said, now, Michelle, here's your job. And like I said, I have my foot in both. So I'm somewhat elementary, somewhat secondary. Your job is to make it really fun and exciting so that they want to take our class in high school. <laughs> <laughs> and if you've ever, Neil deGrasse Tyson, he goes, adults are the ones that ruin science. Kids are naturally scientists. So if that's really what I kind of got was, as long as you're keeping them asking questions, exploring, asking more questions, seeking more answers, a lot of it is just, Always be seeking an answer. Always be asking questions. Yeah. And um, I actually visited with the Teaching and Learning uh, Committee on Tuesday and visited with them um, about the work that has been done, K-5 as well. They will be fully implementing the standards as well beginning next year. And we've worked really hard to get um, the intent of NGSS in those classrooms too. The kids are dissecting worms in fourth grade, um, just a lot of hands-on, and they're being scientists, which is going to prepare them for you know, a little bit more formal science instruction when they hit middle school and then especially when they hit our high school. Great, thank you. Yeah. You talk about the online resource, the online textbook. Yes. What is your perception of our students? Do they gravitate toward one's the, one or the other? Do they bounce back and forth? Is it a matter of convenience that they don't have to take their textbook home? What, are there any trends you see in our students? The trend that I saw when we had the McGraw-Hill, they tended to gravitate towards the hard book, um, mm -hmm. just because it allowed them easier access to see the other topics. Like I said, they're naturally curious. So even though we were on um, physical and chemical change, they were somewhere else in the book at other times, just going, hey, did you see this? So they tended to gravitate towards that, and they felt as though they could see, they could find what they were looking for a little bit quicker in the hard book. Um, but it was almost a 50 fit. I mean, some kids just love having electronics and some prefer to have the hard balance. So. I would say that in terms of the seventh grade, um, when we piloted both of them, they tended to gravitate more towards the physical book. Um, and when I, I actually did a survey of the students, um, I actually did a survey when we were trying to determine whether the, uh, the Pearson books are soft cover, they actually could write in them. Um, but we kind of thought that might be difficult to have 150 of them every year. And, and it also is kind of a waste of paper because we need all three books, but we only need two topics from each book. So I, I asked the question to the students, would you prefer to have a book that you can write in, like the Pearson, or would you prefer to have a hard copy book? And 70% of the students 
said they would prefer to have a book that they could write in. Um, and so they tend to they tend to like having the physical book um, a little bit more, at least the students they surveyed did, and they tended to like being able to actually kind of interact with that physical book. Um, I think if we understand the digital part of the book more, that they'll be able to start interacting more with the book. Because there's a lot of interactive things in the book um, that they can do. And same with McGraw Hill, they both have interactive things where they have to read something and then they do something and they watch a little video and then they answer some questions and things like that. So I think if we get more involved into the interactive book, I think you'll see them start to shift more. But at this point, I, I think they're They also have little simulations. Yeah, like with negative and positive charge, you can move your charger here or whatever, or it wouldn't do it, you'd go back. And so they also have that kind of component too, and the kids seem to enjoy it. simulations where they can manipulate and have it see, oop, that didn't work, reset it, here I go again, try, and, uh, and they seem to like that real well too. Okay. Well, thank you very much for all of your work and for being here tonight to present us with all of this information. We appreciate it. Are there any public comments on the middle school science resources early announcement? Come on. Come on up, Gail. She's she's our next item on the agenda, oh, so that's yeah. why she's not leaving. <laughs> Hello, I'm Gail Seiler from at 420 Briarwood Place. And um, my comment is just more general about the review of textbooks and curricula in general, so not specifically to science, although I was at the Teaching and Learning Committee meeting where Kari, is it Kari? Ms. Smith, um, uh, spoke about this last week, and uh, Director Perez raised the question at that time of cultural relevance, so I appreciate um, that attention is starting to be paid to that. And I think it is really important. So that's my comment, that I, um, I'm glad that that uh, topic is, is coming up and is being asked. And I think I just want to note that that's really important and it's something we need to continue doing. And I would like to, I think it would be helpful if it would then be included in the documents. So in the items that were available for review tonight beforehand, that for this one and the next one, which I think is high school health, is mm -hmm. that what it is? Yeah, there was no um, indication in that of how those things were considered. So again, I, I am glad that those questions are being raised and I'd just like to see some more specifics in the information that's provided of how that was analyzed and how that was, was decided on and, and how that idea of cultural relevance and the topics and the issues and the people that are being taught about um, and their, the social identities that they represent and how that factors into the decision that's made for curriculum. Just, I know I don't need to remind you that science is one of the, we have our SIAC meeting tomorrow and science is one of the areas that um, there's efforts to, a goal has been made to eliminate the uh, achievement gap and we're spending $75,000 for example on middle school science textbooks so it would be, and again I'm not I'm just saying this more generally, but just as an example, it would be good to see uh, how that was considered, how the idea of cultural relevance and diversity was considered in the decision-making process for all of these kinds of decisions. So I applaud the start, but of course I would like to see more. Thank you. Thanks, Gail. We will move on to the next item, High School Health Resources Early Announcement. Tonight I have Matt Steffen, um, Ames High School health teacher with me. The Iowa Department of Education has provided health literacy standards as part of the 21st century skills within the Iowa Corps. And those are required to be addressed as well as some national health standards. And with health and science being on the curriculum cycle, Matt has worked hard to revisit and adjust the health curriculum to meet those guidelines. I'm going to let him talk a little bit about the work that he's done. Uh, all right. Um, so 
first year at Ames High School, I walked in the health classroom that did not have a, currently have a health um, resource, um, working to build that up and um, find a resource that the kids or students can use and reference back to on um, a regular basis uh, with help of my mentoring teacher, Eileen Sullivan, as well as our instructional coach, Michelle Fuqua, I think I said her last name right. Um, they've helped me um, go through a few different books and find a resource that I think best fits the needs of the students as well as meeting our um, national and health literacy standards. So as for why um, the book, Comprehensive Health Book from GW Publishing is first is the currency of the information when looking through other health books, Pearson, McGraw-Hill, um, their copyrights are 2014, 2015, while this one's in 2018, so it's current um, relevant information. Um, the company provides um, the national standards and how they're met within their books, so I can go through and evaluate that it's truly there and match it up with our um, health literacy um, standards as well. Also, in talking to the new middle school um, health teacher, I think this resource helps line up and advance the curriculum that he's putting in place and the new book that he um, got approved earlier this year. Um, as far as the book goes, uh, very easy to access um, as, as well as the online resources, very simply laid out. It's easy to um, search that site for whatever information um, you may be looking for. It provides a variety of review materials, whether it's going through um, PowerPoints, they provide um, short video clips to matching games, vocab words, um, whatever will best help um, the students. <coughs> review the material um, that way. And I think really the biggest thing when we're talking about health literacy standards is that um, it's not only giving them the information but helping them demonstrate and implement it. And the great thing about this resource is it provides ideas on how um, to do that to the teacher as well as to the students. So whether you're talking nutrition, sleep patterns, all those things, you know, kids and adults as well like to ignore um, a lot of the time. Um, it gives them a chance to advance on that. Um, it also does a great job right away in the book of addressing um, the multiple dimensions of wellness. A lot of time we get caught up in health as just a physical thing. It's what you're putting in your body, um, things like that. We know now that it's also built in your emotional, um, intellectual, social, environmental, all those types of things. And that's addressed early and it works throughout the book to um, tie all those dimensions together and everything. Um, that teaches, which is also the goal of what I'm trying to accomplish with the curriculum in health class. Again, the samples will be on display for community review um, for the next week, starting tomorrow through next Monday here at the district offices, as well as um, student services at Ames High School. Questions? The same question for you. <laughs> <laughs> Can you speak to what um, considerations were uh, given to cultural relevance in selecting this particular text? I think at this point in time it was, you know, that when a student were to use this resource that they can see themselves in the text, mm -hmm. whether it's in the pictures or their um, culture or, you know, some of their belief systems mm -hmm. represented in the text. Um, I, I think we're still in a learning and growing process around all of that and um, in CNI, you know, I think we need to come up with some of some specifics and maybe that's with a committee of, you know, things that teachers can look for. But I think at this time, um, that was sort of the guidance we had is that when, can all students use this resource and, and relate to it in some way? Well, that's, yeah, that's what I'm asking. I'm not asking a different question. That's what I'm asking. So are you yeah. saying yes that if any student in the district can open that book and find themselves and their experience in there. Is that correct? Okay. So, okay. Oh, good. And was that based on the fact that it's more up to date than the other things that you considered? Was that part of, part of that? Just not just the facts, but the examples, let's say. I, I think so. Okay. I think that okay. they're. Yeah, well, you'll find when currency. you, yeah, when you looked at like the Pearson and McGraw Hill copies there, all very much the same as they've been, you know, even dating back 10 years ago, I was in high school, they look very similar, it's not updated, there's not a lot of, I guess, that hands-on real life example where you can see, oh, you know, I go through that too, where this more up-to-date one has um, that component to it. But getting back to the point of a student of color being able to open up that textbook and be able to under feel like they're talking about me, is that probably... 
present in the textbook? We felt, yes, with the, I mean, in comparison of the, the ones that we reviewed, it was, you know, the, the least least worst bad yes. one. <laughs> you know? Okay, least of, yeah. least of the yeah. options. Um, and another um, couple questions that I have in mind. What, what are the, what's the contact in, in relation to um, students, not necessarily just self-esteem, stress management, but um, suicide prevention? Um, as far as what's in the textbook, it um, as it doesn't go deeply into that category specifically, but gives ideas of you know how to prevent getting to that um, point. Whether it's starting out with that stress management that you know eventually snowballs into um, events we want to try to avoid, such as suicide, um, things like that. And again, it's um, I guess one resource I'm using. I kind of reference your other question. I'm not teaching the entire um, book. It's using parts right. um, of it as a um, resource uh, when it comes to things like uh, mental health suicide prevention I do bring in speakers with that to address that as well and I have to give the kids a chance to ask questions because maybe they don't know what's going on I guess I know from talking to the speakers that do come in that they've had chances to intervene and prevent those types of things in the past so I'll continue to do that in addition to what's uh, listed in the book as well Okay, and then um, <clears throat> related to human sexuality, it's, um, it's a similar answer I'm going <laughs> to say, but, um, but it's fact-based, reality-based, science-based? Um, I'd say fact-based. Um, it does go through different types of um, birth control things available um, that way. Um, doesn't really give any um, opinion one way or the other. It just right. states what, well, what the fact is um, the that facts. way. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm going to ask the question, just because I have all the science all stars in the house, <laughs> I'm just going to ask this question. They came up to me at a party this weekend. Um, somebody was asking me, for human sexuality, do we give parents the opt-out opportunity? Is that a policy that we do and when we're, we're going to have a unit? Is that a thing that, that a teacher would do? Is that something that, that, that the district does? I wonder. Um, so at fifth grade, we do a human growth and development unit, and we do send home um, a parent letter about okay. a week prior to that content being taught, and there is an opt-out option. Um, I'm not as familiar, I guess, at the high school level. Um, at the high practice. school, it's they have the ability to opt out of that if that um, issue is brought up. Um, generally, they can opt out of the class. Um, mm -hmm. In general, if that... Um, is an issue. I haven't had an instance where anyone has just tried to opt out of that um, session, but I do make it known that that, set, that, that is coming up. Um, if there's an issue with it, where maybe it can be delivered in a different way or sending the information home, um, we can do it that way. But we have an opt out for the class, not necessarily for that one section right now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both very much for your hard work on it. We appreciate you coming tonight and presenting the information. So thank you. Thank you. Any comments from the public on the high school health resources early announcement? Come on up. Hi, my name is Shay Wobig and I'm a student at Ames High School. Um, I just wanted to say that I think getting new resources for the health class is a really big step forward that we definitely need to take because previously, I, I was in health like last year, so previously the texts that we've had available and the resources that we've had available were not up to date. It still had, you know, transgender people and people with anything other than like a straight white male as anything, like as a mental disability listed in there. So, and I, ju I just feel like having an updated resource of that, not necessarily just from a few years ago, but also one that's current in today's times is definitely going to make a better environment for the school too. Great, thank you for sharing your experience. Any other comments from the public? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and move on to board committee work. Any what? highlights any of you would like to make on your included reports. We had a TLC meeting last week and um, I took some 
pretty detailed notes on what we talked about. Um, we, Kari came again to put her in the hot seat as she's walking out the door. Talked about elementary school science and um, more real world practices. A lot of what she said here this evening was also echoed in what she talked about with the elementary schools. Um, I brought up the cultural competency and she's going to bring it to the team where they were talking about curriculum and then she's going to bring it back to the TLC to talk about what they came up with as a, as a group. So I was pretty encouraged by that. I didn't do it. Um, then we also talked about literacy and um, the word study team for grades three through five. It's not me. <laughs> The word study team for grades three through five, and we had some people encouraging us to explore getting the, the grade three foundations to carry forward with that very critical piece that foundations bring. Um, they did some research around the standards and instruction and multi-dimensional functional scale. There's a rubric. There, there was a lot of stuff that they did there. Um, then we also talked about ELP and the two different assessments that were piloted this year. There were some complications trying to get some of the testing done with some seventh graders and some other students. So they were not able to comfortably bring the results to the parents because not every kid had results. So that wouldn't really be fair. But um, the COGAT 7 was the one that they felt provided the most data points to do testing equitably, equitably for all students so that everyone has a chance to take these tests and then determine from that as one component whether or not a child is, is eligible for ELP. So I felt that it was a lot more fair and a lot more equitable for all students to get that opportunity. I was pretty, pretty excited about that. And then they also talked about the Little Cyclone Academy for the teachers right before school starts and um, all the different uh, classes that the teachers can take, you know, before classes actually start. And I just asked as a board member, I said, hey, are, are we able to go to this? And um, yeah, we were encouraged. If we want to show up and be there for the teachers and, and sit in on some of that stuff, we are more than welcome to be there. I can give an update on the equity committee. So the equity committee met on April 23rd. We as a committee have moved to a once a month meeting schedule. So I think it, although it says we're meeting on May 14th, we're actually not meeting again until on the district's website. We're actually not meeting again until May 21st. And uh, what this particular meeting was for was just to update the subgroup progress. So we've broken into three subgroups to really continue to explore whether, uh, whether or not our district would benefit from having an equity office. And so one of our subgroups is, is identifying other districts in Iowa or surrounding states to kind of see how they're handling issues of equity. Um, we're going to, we've identified at least 10 schools that we would like to tour to see how they're handling this issue, to see what might be appropriate here. Uh, we also have moved into the data analysis phase of looking at our uh, historic uh, disciplinary practices. And so that particular subgroup is looking at, I believe, 20 categories of disciplinary infractions and kind of trying to figure out how do we work our way through this in a way that makes sense to other people. And then um, the group that is looking at reviewing uh, proportionality of staff in terms of ethnic and racial and gender identity to the students. That particular group uh, was, was um, given a kind of the history of the efforts that the district had per participated in up to this point by Dr. Taylor. And then we kind of looked at some numbers with uh, the Director of uh, Human Resources. And so we'll kind of continue this work at our next meeting, but we're, we're moving slowly. We're kind of in the data analysis phase right now, so. And Okay. <laughs> Last update on the, um, <clears throat> from I Iowa Association of School Boards in relation to the um, 2018 legislative session. Um, the positive news is that we did dodge um, the, 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 I shouldn't say that, but uh, we, we, we will not have, or we will have the backfill. Um, the legislature chose not to take away the, um, property tax backfill that was promised in 2013 um, to both um, county 
city and school districts. So that will continue next year. That, that was the best thing that happened last week. Unfortunately, um, the bill saved the penny sales tax that helps support our infrastructure, our school buildings, the buildings we're in, our elementaries, our facilities that um, did not get extended from and is still set to sunset in 2029. Um, the proposal was to extend that to 2050 and that did not, we came close. I want to thank my fellow board members, board school board members and superintendents and administrators and parents throughout the state that worked really hard to let their legislators know that that's an important thing that we need to address. Um, but we came close. It, it did pass the House. It um, came out of the Senate committee on Wednesday, last Wednesday, got to the Senate floor on Saturday, and then it died. <laughs> so um, naturally we'll regroup um, and look at strategies for next year and hopefully um, the next s session we can get it past them. Any other updates? Thank you all for those thorough updates. It's, it's very helpful when, when you're not at the committee meetings and some of those that you typically uh, attend to, to get the information. So thank you <coughs> for those reports. Are there any comments from the public? Top road. My comment is for the finance committee, um, admissions of non-students, where does the money go within our school district? And in the near future, maybe perhaps the next board meeting, would the district hold a brief one-on-one -on -one session for everyone here and at home to better understand where that money goes within our district? Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Seeing none, we will go ahead and move on to item eight, filling the vacant board seat. I'm gonna give a, a real quick overview here, uh, and Chris will support me on most of this. If she's got some other things she wants to throw in, she certainly can, but it was actually quite wise of Director Briggs when he uh, announced that he was uh, resigning to identify May 2nd as his resignation date. The reason for that is uh, on that particular date, he and his family did actually move from Ames. Uh, Iowa Code indicates that as soon as the person actually leaves the district, that begins what is uh, best identified as a 30-day clock for this sitting board. Uh, in other words, you have until June 1, if you so elect, to appoint uh, a replacement for Director Briggs on the board. Now, there are some other things that are going on simultaneously to that. Um, primarily that the board has the, has the ability, as uh, happened in the very last vacancy that occurred on the board, you have the ability to, by consensus, agree on someone who would like to replace that that uh, position is vacated by Director Briggs. You also have the ability to um, uh, run an ad, seek for volunteers any way that you want to, uh, and then go through a selection process which may include an interview if you so desire. Uh, I think the interesting thing about this is that the last part of this timeline is that that vacancy must be published. Uh, Chris has put that together and has submitted it to the uh, Ames Tribune. Uh, and actually, the Iowa Code does say published in your local paper. Uh, so it will appear in the Ames Tribune tomorrow. That starts another clock. And that clock is that the members of the community may, within a 14-day period, uh, put together a petition and must seek, right now, the exact number Chris has. I'm going to give you a round number of about 1,200 signatures on a petition that uh, would ask this board to call for a special election. That special election would occur on July 10th of this year. So just in real quick review, you've got 30 days if you want to appoint. The community has 14 days uh, with their running clock to come up with a petition that would uh, actually 
I'm going to use the word demand, but it would direct you to call for a special election on July 10th. Uh, if between those two dates you appoint someone, that person may serve on the board until such time as that special election on July 10th. So maybe I'm going to stop right there and just say, do you have any questions for Chris and, or I relative to that timeline? We're okay? We're good. <laughs> now I'm going to turn it over to President Franson. So um, I emailed the board last week to let you know that, that this was coming, that this discussion, the, um, and I sent you um, our attorney's uh, letter attached to that. And, and that is one of our exhibits for the public that is attached to on, online to, we had our attorney take a look and review it. So um, essentially, we have three options from what I can tell, is we appoint someone, uh, we, um, tonight or May 21st, as those are the two meetings we have before this June 1 deadline, uh, we can do, announce an application process for this position, and um, I, I've collected some information for, that um, a past board had done, I think it was in 2005, yes, October of 2005 that they did at that time. Um, or, um, and then the third is, is that if we're unable to come to a consensus, uh, that it would go ahead and then move to that special election on July 10th. So um, that is the information I have collected. I can share this additional information, uh, but really wanted to provide all of you the opportunity to have a discussion tonight on uh, how we desire to move forward with this. Um, for the public, we, we were very intentional in making sure that we had the posting for the 14 days start tomorrow so that we could have the opportunity to have our board meeting prior to that, um, that uh, deadline, that 14 day count starting. So that is why that posting will be made tomorrow, uh, will be present in the, in the Tribune tomorrow as required by, by statute. So. Can I get, I have two questions. Um, how much does a special election cost and where does that money come from? Uh, Lucinda Martin, the um, county auditor, has sent me the information. Um, she estimates it'll be 15,000. In fact, I just got the bill for the last special election, um, which was just under 15,000. So it would be similar to the, the uh, cost of the referendum and it is out of the general fund. It would be out of this year's funds or next year's? It would be out of, um, since it's in July, um, the first available date because of the blackouts, because of the primaries, is, the only available date is July 10th. Um, so it would be in next year. Okay. Thank you. Is that something that we can decide tonight? So one of the or of our options is also that we could decide that we want to go to a special election or is that just up to the, the community? Well, it, it's by default. So you are, what the statute says is that the board will appoint. Okay, that's it. And then it, then the, it has to have this publication which starts the 14th day for what would be considered a reverse referendum. That we get a petition to f have the special election. However, if you fail to appoint mm -hmm. by June 1st, then the board's secretary is required within three days to call for a special election, and if I don't call for it, the AA director is required to call for the special election. So it would be by default. So you would make a decision that you just don't want to appoint and then force me to call an election. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe a point of clarification, additional point of clarification for the public. This is, we are identifying someone to just complete Director Briggs's term. So he would have been, his seat was up for re, is up for re-election, typically would have been a year from September, but given that they have moved school elections to match municipalities, we are looking at November, so it would be November of 2019. What this, that is what, whether it's an appointment or application mm -hmm. process, however, that, that is the term. I guess, of, of what we are looking at. So. Right. So um, would it be appropriate then to make a motion, and can we do that tonight, to I, uh, move okay. to, uh, or do we need, need to note it on the next agenda? I guess it depends on what your motion is going to be. Okay. If you're going to come to a consensus on how 
to go about soliciting? That's one thing. If you're going to try to appoint someone, I don't no. believe you can do that no, no, tonight. No, no. And that's not, not, that's okay. not what I was going to do. All right. <laughs> um, I was going to suggest, let's use that term okay. for a moment so we can discuss it. Um, I was going to suggest that we uh, move forward with the taking applications um, process. So we would take applications um, or Volunteers, I think, I think Dr. Taylor said, um, and I then volunteers. Yeah, yeah, uh, and and have them submit an application by such and such a date, and then we as a board can interview said number of of uh, of those applications. Of course, you know we don't know how many we're going to get, um, and then that would, since we, the way the calendar works. Uh, we would have two choices. We could, today's the seventh, so if we were to have the applications, it'd be fruitless for us to try to appoint by the 21st because the option for the community, if they wanted to um, call for a special election, would fall on the 22nd. So my recommendation would be that our, our, we would do applications due sometime after the, our next meeting and then, um, or around our next meeting, and then we would fill the position on May, excuse me, June 4th. Does that, does that meet it or is no, that not in time? Have to have point by June 1st. So we'd have to have a special June meeting 1st. or by the 21st. Or by the 21st, mm -hmm. yeah. And my understanding is if we were to move forward in some manner and appoint someone on the 21st, however that we get to that point, my understanding is we can do that, but that decision is negated if we receive petitions, yeah. a petition by the... 22nd or 23rd, 23rd, 23rd is what I heard Chris say. So if, that's my understanding. If, if you appoint, the, the person that you appoint serves until the next school board election. Okay. So if um, you appoint and there's no petition, they serve until November of 2019 unless there would happen to be some other special election in there. When the SAFE bill is in effect, I thought that might happen, but mm -hmm. that's out of play. If you appoint and, an, and a petition is filed, then they serve until the July 10th right. special right. election. Okay. That person so, can run for that position too at that point. Correct. So they could. Yeah. Yeah. So that would be my suggestion that we actually have the applica applications due. Let me get back to the calendar. So if we want to make the appointment by the 21st, uh, we're going to need some time to consider those applications, correct? I'm looking at... <laughs> well, that's what the board needs to decide in terms of how, how we want. So Director Rosser yeah. is suggesting something. Yeah. Maybe before we get into looking at the uh, planning in terms of the dates, I'd be curious, where are the rest of you on this process? I would like to see a letter or some kind of an application or something <laughs> from people interested because as a board, we know a lot of people in the community, but we don't know everybody. Mm -hmm. So there may be people out there that are really, really interested that we may not know about. Right. So it would give, I think, the most fair chance to, to everyone within the community. I agree. I think that a application process is, a, you know, the democratic process, and that's what we should do. We should get everybody a chance who's interested, the opportunity to throw their hat in the ring and be considered. I would ask, I, I kind of have two questions because I want people to know what they're signing up for. Can we go into a closed session to consider these applications? No. Thank you no. for no. asking that question because that is, um, this has to be done. Um, do you want to talk about your, you spoke directly with Drew. So. I did speak with Drew Bracken because I was curious about that exact question. And the answer is, um, according to Drew Bracken, you may, but he would highly recommend not to. So um, generally speaking, when an attorney says not to, then that generally means that they need to be open sessions. Mm -hmm. So uh, will part of the, I'm sorry, just, mm -hmm. so will part of the, uh, if we all are leaning towards an application process, will it be clear, I guess, informed consent about what the person is really signing up for, that they won't be considered in private, they will be vetted in front of everyone? Yeah. Just, but, would that yeah. be a part of, I would say I that would, would probably have to be a part Absolutely. of it, just to be clear. Mm -hmm. yeah. Th this is also my kind of understanding. Um, 
from talking with um, some folks at ISB is that <clears throat> let's say we get 10 applicants. Obviously, we're, that would be difficult to interview all 10. We, we could narrow that down, um, but we wouldn't have to do that in a meeting or a closed session in some way. Um, what we could do, but uh, we would then follow that with interviews. And those interviews would have to be publicly. We couldn't do those in a closed session because that doesn't, the open meetings law doesn't allow for that for, a, for us to fill a vacancy. Do we have to do interviews or we, could we do something like a forum where when we were running for school board we had to do a, a public forum and have people ask questions? So in 2005, they, and I'm reading from the information, and I would be happy to get you all the information, but it, they had two different groups that came in, and um, it was on, it says specifically that it was broadcast live on Channel 12, but they had two different groups of seven, six, one group of six, one group of seven, and they came in and they each were given two minutes to introduce themselves, and then they responded to a couple of questions. So that was how they, um, th that's how it was managed in 2005. Again, I'm not saying this is one way or the other, just tr trying to provide you with some historical mm -hmm. information of what we found in the, the board archives. And that was through an application? Yes, so okay. it was, um, they felt out, filled out a statement of candidacy here, and they had to um, send, they had to answer two questions. Why are you seeking appointment to the Ames Board of Education? And how do you believe you embody the traits described in board policy, BBFA, traits of effective board members? Then it has that, that listed, so. In 2000, just for reference, in 2014, yeah, when Dan Wooden passed away, I just uh, talked to board members individually to find a, a experienced board member that I thought was fairly well respected in the community and everyone was on board with it and we just appointed that person at the next meeting. So there's no application process. Um, I'm fine supporting either way. I'm just worried about the time crunch of how to set up an elaborative process uh, to try to name someone with having to get this done by the 21st. So I'm fine with an, with an application process. I don't know how we cut that down without the fear of a rolling board meeting because um, we can't go in a closed session. So I think it has to be public. Um, can we just set an action on the 21st where we do all the work on that night and vet those people that same night? It'd be a to actually yeah. tell the public this is who we're appointing on the 21st. You could do a work session prior. I'm just worried about the notice though. So if we have 24 hours notice, is that a stipulation to get this done? Oh. So do we have to give notice of who we are appointing? No. 24 we hours? We don't have to. Okay, so okay, we could do, we just have to do, that we could we're do everything in one night. So we could accomplish everything in one night. Yes. That would make sense to have a work session ahead of time and, and do whatever interview process or forum or whatever we do and then vote on it at the, the meeting after. Okay. So something to consider, um, May 21st, we are recognizing Dr. Taylor oh. prior to oh. the board you can, meeting. You can skip that. No. No. <laughs> no, no we don't get to skip that. No. Good try. Yeah, Good try, Dr. Taylor. Yeah, <laughs> and there will be a program at 415. Mm -hmm. So. It could be over by 415. <laughs> it's going to be a little longer than that. So. Um, I can't remember the link that we put for it. I thought it was three to six. It's three, three to five. Makes it's three to six, isn't three it? Six. Yeah, yeah. So we do it as part of the board meeting. Or after. Say that again. We do it as part of the board meeting. That would be mm -hmm. I mean, the other option is just doing it on a different night. I mean, we, we have until June what? June 1st. First. One. So we, we could do it, and again, not only for ourselves, but for the public, for individuals to consider and get the application in and do all that, um, we could consider either doing it later that week or, um, you know, the following, even the 31st. As long as we're done, we have it done by the 1st, we've met the statute, statutory requirement. Um, what's that? That's what I'm wondering. Um, you're that's great. Or 530. Your call. Either one. That makes better Because it would need to be in. 
We're trying to figure out if we. I sorry, I mean, we're trying to figure out if we could accommodate it on the 21st prior to our board meeting. Is it possible? Could we do it um, the 21st, but not start our board meeting till seven o'clock? That's anything's possible. You're in control. Or yeah. seven thirty. Or yeah. yeah. I mean, just so that we can, mm -hmm. because we need to have the. This has to take place prior to the actual board meeting because that's the point mm -hmm. that you have to mm -hmm. have the official vote. Mm -hmm. You can't have the official vote in a work session. So. And Alyssa, I, I like that idea actually that you described of the way they did it in 2005 because we don't know how many applicants we're going to get. And to be honest, I don't know how we would select finalists to interview <laughs> without going into having another meeting, which would have to be public. Um, so I, I think using that model would be a good way to go. Um, of course, do we know if they had more than, because it was what, six and seven? One? It was, yeah, six and seven. What, what I would okay. suggest is, is that if you, um, depending on where you are on it, but one way we could go is, is that you approve this application process mm -hmm. of of how they did it, the statement of candidacy and right. the answering of the two questions. And we could include in it a letter similar that states that um, your candidate forum will be uh, live in a work session, uh, in an open session. And, and what we could do is once we identify the number of applicants, then that would help us if we need to have one group or two groups. Mm -hmm. So if we only have five applicants, we could just have right. one group. Mm -hmm. uh, if it gets to be, I would say more than eight, eight or more, then we would want to identify two groups. And my only suggestion would be that we make the applications due at a time period that if we were to have, if we would feel like we need additional time, like 30 more minutes before our board meeting, that we provide that. So the Thursday prior to the board meeting, mm -hmm. the 21st of, so May 17th, that we would have applications due mm -hmm. so that we can, should we need to make a um, schedule adjustments if we have 35 people apply, I'm kidding, but if we have, yeah. you know, eight to 10 people apply, that would provide us a little bit of flexibility. So a due date for that would be um, the 17th. 17th. May 17th is that Thursday. That makes sense to me. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the questions that I have read, you all feel comfortable that, um, that they will, and, and there's an, uh, they affirm that their information is correct, that they're a candidate, that they're appoint, uh, applying for the vacancy, they're eligible to hold the office, they're a resident of the Ames and 18 years of age. And then I will also include then this second document. Will Chris and I can work on it so that we can adjust it to be our current um, verbiage in our, our policy. Can I ask that we advertise this on the website for the school district? Mm -hmm. That was going to be Eric's on it. I got a thumbs up. So I would, um, I'm assuming the Ames Tribune will do a nice article on this and let people know that we're seeking um, volunteers um, and that they can either um, request the documents through um, my office and the business office of the, here in the building or we'll have it available on the website that they could download. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And Sounds we good. will go ahead. I think we'll be able to get it posted by tomorrow because we've got all of the information here. Not, I'm, I don't want to speak for staff, but he's still getting thumbs up. So we will, we can meet that deadline. Yeah, I so, don't think that'll be a problem. Great. Good. Okay. Great. Good. Everybody feel comfortable with yes. that? Yep. Mm -hmm. just, so, just to clarify, they don't have to be sworn in that night or how does that work out? Oh. Do we appoint oh. and then they get seated the next meeting? No, I think no you'd need to seat them before the first. The they need to be first. sworn in. So yeah, they'd so, be sworn in that night. So they'd be sworn in. I've been in numerous different situations. Oh. Sometimes it's just been a previous board member they've appointed. Sometimes they've came at that meeting and and they've asked a question and they just do a series of vote right there and until it's narrowed down to one and then as soon as it's narrowed down they're sworn in. So um, but I, I do believe they need to be sworn in by June first. Okay. So in the essence of time May 21st is our last meeting prior to uh, June 4th. So we will, um, candidates, you will need to A, be present because we will be having the open forum with you, but then the, the oath of office will be taken that evening. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we will then plan to start 
that board meeting at 7.30 7. or 7. But How about we do 7? And should... Okay. That's not much time. I'm confused. 5.30 to 6.30. We won't, we're going to start the No, 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 no. We would start... Yes, no, the forum would start at 5? 6, right? Our meeting start at 6.30. You can go 5.30. Yeah. His, yeah. his, no, no, no. I he know meetings six. start at 6.30. No, he six. But he goes till 6. Uh -huh. So start at 6. So what could our plan be? We go from 6 to 7 on this, and our board meetings start at 7. And should we have a number of applicants that we feel that won't be enough time, we will push it to 7.30. Mm -hmm. How's that? Are you all supportive mm -hmm. of that? Yeah, sure. that sounds good. And we will have access to the... Um, Absolutely. We'll, we'll get you okay. the information, yes, when, yeah. when we get it in that Thursday. So, yeah. Do we need to make a motion on this then? Or I, I don't think we do. Really. It's, it's a discussion direct. item. Yeah. So. You've just directed okay. staff. We yeah. just directed staff to okay. post that. So. Okay. Good. Great, thank you everyone for, for your conversation on this. Are there any comments from the public? Karen Snyder, 2503 Rich Talk Road. Um, I'm glad I'm sitting over there and not there. <laughs> thank you guys for doing this. It's a lot of work and you've been definitely putting a lot of time with the superintendent search and the high school and so on, so I want to Thank you all for doing that and know that your time is appreciated by us all. Um, the one thing I do want to mention is to, as our representatives and to be our voice within the community, um, would you guys consider doing the same thing you did with the superintendent and having public who listens maybe vote? Maybe Eric could put something together which could be quick, like on what is it, monkey survey, whatever. So you have a quick tally of what people think about the candidates, and then you have that to help you, because if you end up in a deadlock, <laughs> maybe that can help you decide, because there's six of you. Okay. So thank you. We'll take that comment, and if anybody wants to comment on it later during board comments, you may. Moving on to the public forum, and we do not have anybody signed up for the public forum, so we will go ahead and move towards to consent items. Move we approve consent. Second. Moved by Deardorff, seconded by Rosser. We have the minutes from the meetings on April 19, 20, and 23, 2018, support, uh, supplied by Chris. There is the personnel report that comes to us from Lisa. I do want to highlight on the personnel report that um, it also includes the resignation of Dr. Mandy Ross as Associate Superintendent and my opportunity to say thanks for, I've, I've known Mandy for 30 years and her, and her family um, and for your friendship and your support during all of that time. Um, I'm really proud of the school improvement efforts that you have led. Uh, extremely proud is probably the, the highlight of uh, at least my term as a superintendent. And I, it was never more evident to me than the night that the, uh, I think it was a third grade teacher from Edwards came in and sat down and said, because of you, you've revolutionized teaching and learning in the district. And it's, and it's very, very true. Um, other than that, I think the, in, the engagement that we, we talked about in the PLCs and um, the instructional leadership that you uh, provided to help us become data-driven is just uh, something that was ahead of its time. Um, and so thank you for all of your work and your support throughout the years. The personnel report also contains three other uh, resignations from certified staff. There are gifts to the district uh, that include fabric, craft items, and decorating supplies from Joanne Fabrics and, and Crafts to the district. $335.01 from Gurdeep Bawija uh, to Fellows and $10 from Jim McCool to Fellow School. Uh, the uh, continuous open enrollment, I forgot to mention that before that one, so I'll jump back down to 13 now, which is the contracts and agreements, the one with Ken Williams for the on-site workshop, uh, which is just prior to the little cyclone uh, teaching workshop and the agreement with Houston Shelter Services from Dr. Jones for a continuation of their assistance, uh, student assistance program. 
All right, it's been moved by Deardorff, seconded by Rosser. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Passes 6 0. Action items, uh, policies for action. I, we talked about these last session, and um, have we had any feedback from the public? We have not. Yeah, there wasn't, um, they were just minor changes. There wasn't, so nothing changed about the way we do things. I think there was some concern that we were changing boundaries or changing procedures, and that's not correct. What the changes have done is really just put into policy what we're actually doing. And I think the only two new ones are the open enrollment in and the open enrollment out. Otherwise, everything is, always, as it's always been, it's just being codified into policy, so. Move approval of the agenda, or the uh, policies? Second. Moved by Deardorff, seconded by Colton. Discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Passes 6-0. Item 15, board meeting schedule. I move the board approve the 2018-19 board meeting schedule as presented. Second. <clears throat> Moved by Rosser, seconded by Colton. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Passes 6-0. Item 16, superintendent's recommended general fund budget for 2018-19. I can make a comment at this point. There's, um, from a discussion that I had with Director Rosser last week, I presented uh, actually um, another option that was presented by Director Rosser at that time um, that um, essentially was trying to build up. I know when he was going after a higher, much higher contingency um, by reducing the uh, superintendent of curriculum or of, sport, of school improvement actually to a director, uh, the elimination of the additional uh, elementary principal, and then the reinstatement of the student advocate. And I, th I think what um, the best way that I can describe, I think, our conversations, we were looking through the same lens, but just from the other side. You're looking at from the standpoint of uh, let's make the changes now and let the new superintendent decide how they want to organize their staff and put things together. I was looking at it from the standpoint of here it is, this is what we've got. Much of the budget was put together with the help of the administrative team. Um, we knew that what we were really trying to do on all of this was, as Chris has helped us out all this time, is try to make sure we got our spending authority back, make sure we had something that was going to be balanced, which it absolutely is, and something that had a contingency so that we can really be a, uh, a little bit more prepared is maybe the best word for what could happen with our enrollment this fall. Mm -hmm. So those were the goals. I think the, the, um, both of these uh, options that were thrown out are, are ones that meet exactly those expectations. So I'm going to leave it up to the board at this point on um, some direction to me if you wish to do that. But we're ready to move forward. And I'd and like to add it. And if I can, just sorry. one last thing. First, sure. the most important part here is uh, what, uh, what is actually going to happen in the very next item, which is item 17, which is reappointment of teaching staff. Um, so uh, as we're moving through this discussion here or changes or whatever you would like to do to that particular budget, um, the important part is getting those reappointment of teaching staff taken care of if we can so that we can get contracts out to them as soon as possible. So. Yeah. Prior to some, here. sorry, prior yep. for, to some discussion, I we think need we need motion. to entertain a motion. I move the board approve the preliminary superintendent's budget as presented. I'm preliminary budget number two. Uh, well, I, yeah, I purposely didn't say revised. Just okay, you're I was going with the first, first one. one. Yeah, but he doesn't even want the first one. Is that right? No. Didn't Who's know what he, he? Said? I, Dr. Um, Taylor. Okay. I, I will second that. <laughs> To get Is that what he table just said? So we can discuss. I just want to make sure because I have two, right? Yep. And me, your, here, you did revised. This is yours. That number two is the one that was revised with suggestions from Director Rosser. Right. And you're voting to approve the first one that's not revised. Correct. Okay. That's his motion. I second it. Okay. So it has been moved by Deardorff, seconded by Rosser. Yeah. And I just I, like, I want to make sure that I'm clear here okay. um, to approve the. Preliminary superintendent's budget, not number two, the with preliminary. The highlights. Correct. Yes, the okay. one with the highlights. Thank right. you. The yes. first one. Okay. Thank you. And, I, and, I and maybe if we could get uh, one of our staff, I think I have an extra copy. If we could get it on the ladybug. 
That's Which fine. one would you like? It does look like a well, I, we'll I, have, we, I've got both of them if they need to see. I'm just checking my numbers to make sure. So this is the one that was moved. Okay. Thank you, Eric. I would like to make a couple comments real quick. I did when I was discussing this with Dr. Taylor. Um, my intention was not to offer a opposing budget. My intention was, and I asked him to, and he did, um, present s some of the different numbers to us and so that we as a board can make the decision of, well, if we add this, it's going to cost this much. If we add that, you know, things that, for example, the social worker back at the middle school, um, if, if we subtract this, ju just so that we as a board can understand the different pieces um, of, of what we would do. Um, so my intention was never to propose an alternative budget um, necessarily, it was to um, propose, give us the information, the data, the numbers, so that we can make an informed decision on, on that. Now I do have um, <clears throat> feelings regarding why, and especially when um, during our interview process with the new superintendent, we made it clear to both candidates actually that we wanted them to make um, some evaluations of how they want their administrative team to be structured. Um, so that's in relation to um, the funding level that we would have for either a associate superintendent via a curriculum director. Um, and that's where, you know, that number can, can vary. Um, so I just want to stop right there. We can talk about what I'd like to do is talk about the various details um, and possibly uh, offer some amendments. Um, but th that was my intention, again, not to offer an alternative budget, but just to get out some other numbers so we could discuss it. I, the way it was worded, I took it as you submitted a different budget. I did. Which um, I, I didn't feel was appropriate for a board member to do for individually submitting budget information for the whole board to review. Uh, there could be some legal ramifications for that. I've done some homework on it. According to the audit and budget oversight policy, which is 707.1, it's the duty of the audit and budget oversight committee to provide input, review, and support in the preparation of the district's overall statutory budget and general fund operating budget. That's a committee and not an individual. Mm -hmm. The superintendent is actually the person who should be submitting the, the budget to the board, which he's doing for review. Um, it's described further in the powers and duties, policy 201.2, under duties of the superintendent. He should be the one to prepare and submit to the board a preliminary budget. We have also re received emails from concerned community members and students about the removal of the Ames Middle School social worker uh, position and it is my opinion that we need to discuss that further that mm -hmm. portion further given the feedback we've received not only from that individual but also from the public as well as students that have received help from that person mm -hmm. we have a new superintendent starting in less than two months and I don't feel it's fair to the district or the new superintendent to adopt a budget with a lot of changes to it. We're placing our trust in her to come in, learn the lay of the land, and make these decisions in the best interest of the district. By making substantial changes before she starts, I feel it sends the wrong message to her, especially concerning her own staff and whether or not we need to hire an associate superintendent or a director. I, I completely agree with you, um, Director Perez. Um, I did not ask Dr. Taylor to present a separate budget at all. I asked him to present me with additional information related to the detailed um, line items that we discussed. In addition, I wish you made reference to the committee, the oversight committee, the budget and audit oversight committee. Thank you for bringing that up because that committee has never met other than to receive the audit report this past year since I've been appointed to it. We've never had an opportunity to discuss anything about that. If we had, if that committee had been called and had an opportunity to discuss this, these budgets that Dr. Taylor was going to pre present to us, the board would have had at least two weeks notice, if not more, to begin these discussions, at least be in the know of what was coming forward. But unfortunately, the first time we saw this 
preliminary proposed budget was at our last board meeting. And, and it, it's, I think it's a shame that we're being forced to, in a very short period of time, gather information and make a thoughtful um, decision on important issues. Um, I completely agree with you. Again, I've made a point before when we were meeting with our superintendents and interviewing them, we wanted to, one of our directions that we gave them is that we wanted them to reevaluate their administrative chain as soon as they get here and for them to decide, um, you know, how they wanted to proceed forward. So that's the flexibility that I, 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 I was suggesting with some of these offers. So um, let me make this one amendment. So the, the motion that we have on the floor right now is the original um, budget. So I would like to amend it to reinstate the um, student advocate position at the middle school, um, which would be um, bringing back the $67,500. I'll second. So we have a, an amendment by Rosser, seconded by Colton. Can I talk or do we have to vote? No, we, no, I, I was just going to say any discussion. No, just, yeah, okay. So go ahead, right ahead, Dr. So I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm just actually confused. So we've had several budgets or mock budgets or faux budgets, and I think my particular concern is really echoing what Director Rosser said. I am concerned that this has not, it doesn't seem as though this budget has been vetted by the budget committee. Um, I'm hearing Director Rosser saying that they haven't met. I did speak to former Director uh, Briggs, who also said he felt that he was not able to give any contribution to this. And I guess my thought is we have, as board members, two jobs, right? We have to appoint and manage the superintendent, and we manage the budget. And, and we have a committee structure. And my and is, so is, am I just mistaken that this is not supposed to go to the committee? It just comes straight here. I mean, I guess that because the way everything else works is something goes to the committee, there's substantial discussion, the committee then presents it to the board, you know, and it's gone through a process. And I guess because this is maybe my first time doing it, but there seems to be a lot of angst and consternation. There's several changes, and I'm just concerned about, it's a procedural concern that I have. Sure. So historically, um, I've, I've been on the audit and budget uh, committee. This was one thing that never came formally through that committee. Mm -hmm. It was more of, uh, this is a, a really strong board discussion and deliberation on how we want to move forward. So it was more of Dr. Taylor and the superintendent bringing forward the recommendation and then we talked through it. So I guess my thought was we should talk through the, the validity of having an assistant elementary principal, the validity of having a student advocate then we can come to a decision on what this amendment or what this proposal should be. So I think if those are the points of consternation, let's talk through those as a board, and then we can still then move forward. With the point of order, we should be, the, the motion on the floor is the amendment that was made and seconded regarding adding back in the student advocate to the budget. That's what we should be discussing and debating right now, not okay, everything then, else. I, I think there was denied. just some clarification for some clarification for the process of, of how we have arrived at where we are tonight. We'll get into that later, but my point is that we should be discussing by parliamentary procedure, Robert's Rules of Order, which we are governed by. That's the motion on the floor and that's what we should be discussing. So I'll be turning down this motion, I'll be voting no. I want to say that we received, so we're talking about the student advocate, the social Correct. worker at the middle school, we received a lovely email from a student in the community um, who fiercely advocated for how important this person was in their life. They presented a string of, of names of other students who had supported it, and it's clear that this person is impactful and meaningful to that school climate. When we first had this conversation, how I heard it was it was a mutual agreement that this person no longer have that job. Um, that maybe is not how that person understood it. It's, it's completely unclear. I don't feel like I have any good information to make any kind of good decision one way or the other. Do you want no, to? I, I, I definitely want to jump in here. Okay. The thing, Chris and I talked about budget and audit committee, and the reason we didn't do it is you guys weren't busy the last couple of weeks. I know that. You were definitely too busy 
we just talked about it and I said, let's put this together because we need to get a budget in place. It's a nice discussion item for you. It wasn't that we were trying to skip anything. It was absolutely because you were too busy at the time. And if you don't want to accept that, then that's fine. I want to come back and clarify a couple things for you. Just prior to presenting this budget, maybe an hour or two, we found out that the fourth counselor at Ames Middle School will not be funded or cannot be funded through the AOP program, along with a .2 liaison. That was prior to putting this budget together where Mr. Fox indicated that he preferred the four counselors because they were kind of stumbling over each other. I was hoping that he was going to be here to explain that and that if we were looking for cuts, the advocate would be a place for it to come from. In this situation and talking with Mr. Fox at this time, if he can't have the counselor, which he can't because we don't have the funding, he would like to have that advocate back. So what you're recommending is exactly what we plan to do. What we have been, and by we, I'm talking about Chris and I, are struggling. If you want to talk about a $54 million general fund budget, and we're struggling to find $67,000 to cut. We can make it happen. It's a combination of a little bit of what Dan can provide, what, Dan, uh, what uh, Dr. Jones can provide, and what Dr. Ross can provide out of overrun in her curriculum department. We can put that back and still maintain a, a uh, contingency somewhere in that $120,000 range. So in my defense and in Chris's defense, we both agreed that you are too busy. In the past, just as Luke had mentioned, we put the budget together because that's my responsibility and I brought it to you. Now, have a discussion and tell me what you want to do with it. My responsibility, as I indicated to you, is done because it is, it's a stable budget, it provides a, con a, uh, a contingency, and it establishes what was really important for us at this point and is actually the six items at the top of that list. It's a repayment because our, in, our enrollment increased and we've got to get our spending authority back to that 5% level uh, for the new superintendent to come in and have a solid budget in front of her when she goes to work. So um, I'm sorry to get a little bit, I'm not really sorry to get that emotional about it. I wanted you to know exactly what was happening and what was going through my head at the time. And I'm going to I'm going to jump in here too because I, I was worried that we hadn't had the committee meet. We, we went over budget when we did audit. We went over the the, the cash flow scenarios. We went through the, the forecasting model. So we went through the the big budget when we met in addition to the audit. However, Dr. Taylor and the administration was still struggling to find where these cuts were going to come. We would have had to have had a meeting the week of either the, or the days of the 18th, 19th, and 20th. If you recall, those were the days you were interviewing. I came in and said, what do I do? I've got to call a budget meeting. They've, they've been meeting for two days straight. You hadn't made a decision on the superintendent. We knew we had special meetings set up for that. So that's, that, I mean, that's really, you know, if, I, I apologize. I'm chair of that committee. I, I should have called it, but I just didn't know what to do with the time and still have him be able to present that budget on the 23rd, which is what he wanted to do. So it wasn't, it wasn't trying to bypass the committee as much as... <laughs> I told Chris it would be all right. She because, was about uh, because we have been so busy, I thank um, Director Rosser for taking the time and going through the, um, through, the, um, through the budget. I don't agree with all of it, but it provided me um, uh, something else to look at, so I thank you for doing that. Um, I am in full support of um, adding the advocate back on. Is and, the advocate in which budget is the advocate in? Because we have a motion to approve the amended, preliminary. It, it's it's in the amended. Right, but there's no motion for that okay, one. So, no. so right. on the motion the table, on the right. floor, point is of order. The amendment reinstates it, the student advocate. Correct. The motion mm -hmm. on the floor is to reinstate it. It's been seconded, and that's all we should be discussing. Um, on that point, as, and I want to clarify what something that Dr. Director Taylor Rosser, just said. Can I, I want to make sure, has everyone had an opportunity, I'm not keeping track, but I do want to, out of respect for the rest of the board members, has everyone had an opportunity to discuss the amendment? Because I believe you've I already believe had so. an opportunity. Okay. Um, I just want to clarify something that Dr. Taylor just said. 
so so now we're looking at since this budget was presented having to go down to three counselors at the middle school that's correct, correct? Mm -hmm. and now um, the principal mr. Fox would like to retain this position the social worker the student advocate, advocate. the student advocate social worker she's a certified social worker for him tonight, but I would suggest someone speak to him to talk about those two positions and let him discuss the pros and cons with you of which one. Well, I thought that's what you just said. I did said. talk with, with Dan about that. Okay. Yeah. So his preference right now is because he's losing the counselor's position to maintain the student advocate who is a certified social worker. Correct. It's not his preference. The, the question that you have right here is that replacing the counselor at Ames Middle School would probably run in that neighborhood of $80,000. Maybe and we it, should, can you clarify, it's the success counselor. The success we have, this, counselor, we have right. three counselors, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade at the middle school, right. but the success counselor is what you're addressing with Dr. Sorry. Yeah, for that's, that, but I no, that's sure fine. I'm that's the one that yeah. cannot be funded through ALP any longer. So. Right. Because of that, we're looking at either 67,000 with, and he's got three counselors, one at each grade level. And my discussion with him is even though he preferred to have the counselor, that price is a little bit hard to handle at this point where you're trying to make cuts, you may have to settle for the student advocate, which is something that we can cover. And, you know, you may think that with that much money, trying to find an additional 12 or $15,000 is tough, but it's tough. It's very difficult at this point. So, it, you know, it's a matter of, of what we need to live with in order to do the job for kids. And if the student advocate can do the job for kids and Dan is, is fine with that, then that's the direction we'll go. So if we, do not, if, we, if we do not pass this motion, then next year at the middle school, there will be only three counselors. That's correct. Period. Right. In the student services office. Right. Dr. Taylor, you, um, when you were talking about that, so it's my understanding that there is an opportunity, though, to find some funds so that you said something about so that the contingency could still remain close to 120000 by recovering some funds. I think I heard from C&I. From C&I a little reason. bit, hopefully from Dr. Jones. And there, we had three resignations tonight, too. You know, you can't really count on uh, the fact that you're going to save a tremendous amount of money when you have resignations. But there is still a little bit coming in. And so it's fluid at this point from that, from actually looking at it as static. It's a little bit more fluid. I will tell you, you're probably going to have at least two more resignations uh, in June and probably another one in July. Okay. Well, it's, it's a matter of recovering some um, funds because of um, uh, people that are leaving and you're uh, sometimes hiring people that are not as experienced. So you recover some costs. We can make it work for this year. I think the, the other important thing I think for the board to understand is those um, actually the six things at the top. Mm -hmm. And if you look at next year, and, and Chris is right, if we get this taken care of so that we can establish our spending authority, you've got nearly five or $600,000 that you'll be able to work with next year because <laughs> we're trying to take care of it this year. She's shaking um, her head no behind you. you. Well, it, if, if our enrollment grows and we get 1% allowable growth again next year, then yes, those don't have to come off those new revenues like they did this year. But those are ongoing costs unless we're eliminating the positions. Right. They're, they're not costs that go away after next year. But if we get 200 more kids next fall, we're going to be right back in the same place, right? <laughs> well, with uh, 120,000 in, in contingency right now, uh, I know our kindergarten numbers are really, really high. Um, so that's the one that I really keep a bigger eye on than anything else. The one that uh, is, it is more fluid, again, I'm going to use that word, are, are elementary uh, enrollments one through five. And the reason for that is we know that we're going to lose some kids over the summer, but how many more are we going to gain? And then I go back to what happened uh, two years ago where we lost 250 kids over the summer at the elementary, and I st still it's unexplainable. But so is it unexplainable that last year, 
Uh, we did drop some kids during the summer, but enrollment overall increased 171 or 179 kids. That's pretty amazing. So it's wise to have a contingency here so that this won't happen again. So what you're saying, just to kind of recap, is if we were to pass that motion, um, we would still be able to recap that money, correct? We, to we still will have make contingency. It work. We will make it okay. work. And then I, I see a couple of principles here. That is not a motion to take away their um, assistant. assistant principal, correct? Yes. Correct. Okay. And we're just putting down the amendment. That's yes. why I was hoping to talk mm -hmm. about the other things. Yeah. That go into that. So how about, so I want to just make sure that we're all clear because sometimes amendments can be kind of tricky. Mm -hmm. So we are making an amendment to the original motion. What we are voting on is to amend the original motion to reinstate the student advocate position for $67,500. Yes. Is everybody clear? Yes. All right. All those in favor of the min of the amendment indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The amendment passes 6 0. Yay. We now go to the original motion. Okay, I'd like to. Um, oh, well, go ahead. I just, it'd be nice if we could talk to them all at one time because they might Sorry. work together. So yeah. it'd be nice if we could just have a discussion on this. So for the assistant elementary principal, could you, um, yes. Principal Flanishaw, talk about? how you're managing the facility currently, and if there's any better ways of um, leveraging your expertise to help kids be successful, given the large <coughs> enrollment at both of your buildings. So I would start by just sharing that uh, Fellows has continued to grow as a learning community. Um, we anticipate uh, that we'll be at around 580 next school year. Um, with 77 staff um, that enter the building each day to serve kids. Um, currently, this past year, uh, as I transitioned into the position, I had 28 uh, certified staff evaluations to conduct, um, which was a quite a large number, um, and to do it well and in depth. Um, it's taken countless hours um, outside of the school day, obviously, to do that, but then also during the school day, uh, being in classrooms and observing is obviously a focus um, and something that I want to do. Uh, it's just the hours uh, that were spent in concentration with those 28 staff members uh, to really go deep in their um, improvement and also celebration of what they're executing each day on behalf of kids. Um, so generally speaking, I would say uh, the hope would be to begin to kind of distribute some of the workload, um, specifically those areas that are management heavy, uh, to make sure that I can really function as an instructional leader and shed some of the management um, that is just part of any uh, school, uh, but particularly larger buildings, uh, that management load is much higher. Just to jump in, I can tell you that I've been sitting next to Brandon back here, and he's, he's working on an evaluation right now. If you open his computer as you all are talking about things, and I also know that he, uh, his spring break this year was evaluations. He, that he didn't go anywhere other than maybe his living room to do those. Um, he's talking about the staff side of things. I would also talk about the kids side of things. Um, when you have more kids, you have more fights at recess. When you have more kids, you have more IEP meetings. When you have more kids, you have more phone calls from parents and things like that. So um, the bigger buildings have all of the same things that the other buildings have, but there's just more of it. And uh, I, t I met with Tim and Mandy earlier in the year to just talk about some things that were on my mind. And I said, I feel like a cup that water is being poured into and water is just running down it, but it keeps being poured in. And I feel like we could really use some support. So is there some best practice or industry standard on where that sweet spot is for a principal per student ratio? Is it 400 kids, is it five, 600? Where, where should we be looking at adding positions once a building gets to a certain level? I haven't seen too many elementary buildings that approach that, that 600 range that did not have a full-time, actually, assistant principal. Um, as I said, 
During the school year, I get requests for additions, um, and probably on a six to one ratio, five people are told no. But when um, Brandon and Steve and um, I sat down with Mandy and we talked this thing through, trying to realize that you've got, right now I think it's 588, Brandon, you're closing in on 600 kids in there. You've got 28 staff members, not to mention your EAs, which runs up to uh, 77 staff members, with that number of kids, with two autism classrooms, um, and no wonder you're frustrated. But the main thing is trying to get the research, which I mentioned, I think, one of the, at the last board meeting, the research relative to an assistant principal or even a SAM working in a building at halftime would clear up 27 additional days where these two guys could be instructional leaders in their building as opposed to handling phone calls, taking care of the scrapes and, and the bumps and what's going on, management on, on the um, playgrounds, um, the things that you're doing with PLCs and meeting with, with staff members, which doesn't, should take more time, but it's not because you're tied up in more of the management things. So that's why I wanted to build into this budget some way that we could get some help for these two buildings because they're the largest. They also have the autism classrooms in it. Um, and I think if I looked at my numbers right, you can pretty much take Sawyer and uh, Mitchell and combine the enrollments and it might come pretty close to where Brandon is at at the current time. So that was my reason for including it on there. Um, and I can give you a list of all the things that came to me from uh, building principals and other staff members that they wanted added in here that they didn't get. Uh, for instance, the additional day for educational assistance for uh, professional development. Uh, the three teachers that the high school wants, and as you can see right here, they're gonna get a .67 because they can juggle the schedule around even though the class sizes may increase just a little bit. But this one is the one that had the hot button for me and the reason that I put it in this particular budget. This, this um, for me, it's a critical addition. And I thank uh, Dr. Taylor for adding it. Um, I've been in, the, in that building. I, I know how many times the only one that can solve a problem is the principal. The only one that can solve the same, 10 problems at the same time is the principal. I've seen it, and I'm sure it's exactly the same at Meeker. It, this is crucial. I do not want to lose two good principals out of burnout. That, that is what it comes down to me. I, I, I see the amount of work, how much you two care for your buildings, that I'm, I'm very happy to support this. The other thing I might mention just in closing on this one, if you look at the very bottom line, the elementary principals are, have been a pretty solid team in all the time that I've been here. And what you're seeing right there is the building principals agreeing to take a cut in their particular budget so that they could support Brandon and, and uh, Steve in this. I, I have some questions, but I guess my questions are for Dr. Taylor. Is that okay, or do I have to yeah, ask them the questions? Because nope. I don't think they can answer them. So I guess I'm just curious. I, I'm hearing what the principals are saying. I believe you. It sounds crazy, right? It sounds like a lot. I'm sure you don't make enough money. But I'm wondering, why is this a surprise? Like, why are they surprised they have 588 kids when the building was meant to hold that many children? Why are they surprised that they're overwhelmed by an autism classroom when they are the designated school for the autism classroom, right? Like, I guess I'm wondering, why we're surprised that they're overworked when we have designed the space mm -hmm. to produce this. And so now we're in a reactive position. Um, I'm wondering, because there's other, there are other schools that have other issues, how are we planning to address those needs long term? And then if I heard you correctly, I thought you said the addition of an assistant principal would add 27 days. Would clear 27 That's days. That's $106,000 for 27 days. Is that the most efficient way to solve this? And if what I'm hearing primarily is overwhelming the problem is the, the way we require them to um, to evaluate our teachers, is there just not an easier way to evaluate our teachers? Like is $100,000 to clear 27 days so the, our principal can evaluate teachers the best use of our money overall? This it, just question. It would clear them from having to do that kind of supervision because they've got somebody else up to with the management part. If you want to talk about teacher evaluation, it's required by the state. Sure. So, and the form is required by the state and the standards are established by the state. It's a lot of work. I want to come back and answer your other question. It's a surprise to me that we added 200 kids this last year. 
It won't be a surprise next year, but it certainly was here because that hadn't happened until the 1990s. And if you look at the enrollment figures that you just got, since um, the um, actual last sheet that you got, which was in March, there's been 25 additional kids added to fellows already. That seems to be the hot spot. Steve was living in the hot spot in the years before that, where it really grew to the point where we were, you know, we were getting static about building buildings too big, and now they're starting to fill up. So it's really a matter of delaying it until we, you're right, until we did reach a crisis mode. I don't think there would have been as much support from the board a year ago or two years ago to add an assistant principal in either one of these buildings because the difficulties in the enrollment was not that high. And then, you, uh, just one more question. So do you anticipate something similar for the other three buildings in the future? I know you're leaving, but just yeah. like with your experience, what do you see for that? Absolutely. I see that happening at Edwards, and I see it happening at Mitchell in particular. And the reason that I say that is that you can take a look at the construction that's now taking place in the Edwards neighborhood just west of there. It's starting to blossom up, and many of their classes are filled up. The other um, major area of development in the city is just on the west side of South Duff, and all of those people will be going to Mitchell School, and they're actually starting to get pretty crowded at this very time. If the, if the and I'm not going to mention any of the property that's sold down there, but Mitchell's could be another hot spot down the road. That's why I was trying to really set the board up for the future by um, getting, uh, and you put it in your referendum to add additional classrooms on to three buildings that I think are going to be the hot spots in the future, which are Edwards, and which are Meeker, and which are Mitchell. Um, it's just an enrollment thing. Thank you. I have a couple. I have a couple questions regarding the historical enrollment for these particular two schools, let alone the other three. What, what's oh, been I'm the sorry, historical what the question? What's been the historical enrollment um, for the past several years, or let's say five years? They're all starting to increase right now, but they were fairly steady in the past. As a matter of fact, Edwards at one time was a two-section building, as was Sawyer. So they're starting to grow into three sections at the current time. So our enrollment is going up. What was it at Fellows and Mitchell? I mean, excuse me, at, at Fellows for the past five years? I can and, get and, you that information. And see, that's the thing. If we have had a budget, mm -hmm. and I know <laughs> previous board members, I won't use their names, um, who served on the budget committee, the first thing they would have asked, they would have said, well, what were the previous years? Okay, let's justify this so that when we come to the board, we have those answers, that information to answer people's questions. I have difficulty supporting this because, yes, there are those in the community who are saying, well, we've never had this position before. The, the, and again, I believe what you're saying. I, I agree with... With, with what Monique said. I don't question that, but I do question whether there are other ways in which that you can get the support, other supports to do that. Because $106,000, that's a lot. That's two teachers. You know, one of the things that we, you know, all talk about, you know, reducing class sizes and, and dreaming of being able to do that at low, our lower grades. Good heavens, $166,000, that's two teachers. So I'm just looking for more support. And I appreciate you guys coming and saying, you know, how difficult the work is and the increase in, in recent numbers, but you haven't brought to us the argument of, well, how have those numbers actually increased in, in recent years? We know how they went up this past year, but how does that reflect for the previous five, six, seven years at, at, at Fellows or at Makers, for that matter. I believe we got something a few months ago that was talking about the enrollment at the different schools throughout the past several years, and it did show a, a trend upward in growth. Um, I know I'm not surprised at how busy you are, because I know I've talked to you, Steve, about how much time you put in. I've gotten emails from you on Sunday talking about upcoming events. So. I, I'm not surprised at the amount of work that they put in. And I, I do remember seeing a document, I don't think I have it with me, but it did talk about the different enrollments per school trending over the past, I think it was 10 or 15 years. Okay, the, the, the one concern I have is that now, <clears throat> we currently now have a um, surplus now of only a contingency of only fifty two thousand six hundred and thirty one dollars 
that's what our next superintendent will have when, when she starts on July 1st. Unless we make some other amendments to this tonight, that's what we're leaving her with. Um, so uh, unless we can find some other cuts, um, consider them next week, uh, or excuse me, in two weeks, um, I think you know, that's a possibility. We can pass this and look at other amendments later on. Um, that, that's, that's an option too. But let's, you know, let's not forget that since the motion that we just passed, um, we're now looking at a contingency of only $52,000. Dr. Taylor, could the incoming superintendent, if the board decided tonight we weren't ready to um, make this change, could the incoming superintendent, let's just say on day one, decide to use that money to hire sure. the particular role? Is that possible? Sure. Okay. What is the hiring process in terms of timing of one, someone who might be interested in a position like that? Um, how does that timing play out? It's going to be about three to four weeks. If you get it posted and, get, and let it run for two weeks, you can then interview and try to hire somebody by the end of the third week. So as you're looking down the road, you want to m make that in mind. I think of the, the associate superintendent or the associate uh, or assistant principal, whether it's a SAM or an assistant principal, is one that will probably be pretty highly sought out. Um, and as a result, I'm not necessarily worried about the timing on that. I'm more worried about getting the help for these guys. I think where I am struggling, um, as I look at my, my role as a board member, and um, clearly it is very much one of my top priorities and roles to approve this budget. I struggle when our staff has been willing to give up $50,000 knowing that in that very same budget they're adding $106,000 to support two of their colleagues. Um, I struggle that uh, while I, I understand and I appreciate that the board desires to help identify some efficiencies so that this addition is not necessary, I don't think that the our administration and our administrative team comes by this lightly without uh, giving it lots of um, reflection and looking at any ways to um, avoid, avoid this addition. I struggle knowing that we have 588 kids in one building and one instructional leader and building management person. I, um, I, I was having a asked to discuss about gun violence in schools yesterday and, and the discussion came up around this idea of how big are our elementary schools and what are the ways that we are supporting those communities and had someone who was a member of, um, of the fellows family in a support role share that it's very real and I know that you have on your budget tomorrow night for consideration of, of uh, this assistant principal role and so I struggle why I believe I have the knowledge of a board member to not approve this when essentially our set of eight who are building principals along with our administrators have said, let's find the money so that we can at least provide a portion of that. So the 50,000 in cuts to building budgets, they're making cuts so that they can help to make this a reality. Because if that 50,000 wasn't in there, 106 would be really hard. So I am supportive of this position. I appreciate the work that all of our principals do, uh, but I, th I think in, in this day and age when we are asked to do so much, uh, we need to be able to provide the support to all of you because this position would support to provide support to them, but also to all of the, the teaching staff and the other staff within those two buildings. So that's why I am in support of this, this position staying in the budget. So now anyone else has other comments, I'd like to talk about the curriculum director just so we know what that decision would mm -hmm. entail. Mm -hmm. So can you, uh, I guess, talk to the idea of we're going to be removing an associate superintendent uh, and making it a director of curriculum. Uh, to Gina's point, I appreciate uh, the desire to try to keep the status quo. Uh, the new superintendent can always make that change should she decide this is the best structure. So. I'd rather provide the stability of the current structure to give her flexibility there. So I would, I would uh, not include the reduction of twenty thousand um, dollars as it was revised. Mm -hmm. I support that as well. We had the discussion with both of the candidates that we wanted them to provide um, to get here and, and help us to make that 
um, decision. So I am supportive of keeping the money in now so that, that I, I think it's harder to um, add it back in later on. Can I ask another question? I'm sorry. I'm going to go back to the, the assistant elementary principal position. Okay. And it's related to the curriculum director position. So if we approve it today, does it mean it's filled soon? Or can we wait until, can we just approve it? And then when the new superintendent comes in, she decides if she wants to fill the assistant principal role. She decides if she wants to have a associate superintendent, whatever, like we've just cleared the way. Like, is, it, is there a way to have it, to have it both ways, a compromise? Oh, absolutely, yeah, you're in charge at this point. I mean, I, I think that, because where we're at, like I don't want to do, because I don't know. I don't have enough information to know anything for certain, right? And so I'm, I'm hearing these very compelling arguments and I can see one way or the other. I want to set, I want to do right by our students. I want to do right by the budget and our obligation, but I also want to do what I can to make sure the incoming superintendent is successful. And I'm just not sure if there is a right way to do that. Um, I certainly don't want to leave the poor lady with $50,000 after we sold her about how great our district was, right? Um, but I also don't want to pigeonhole her into the, the district looking in a way that she might not design it herself. Does that make sense? So. On that note, I think if we decide, which I fully support, um, to have the, the assistant so, um, principal, if we, I would prefer if we pass it, that we fill it. I don't want to give her the illusion that she has money when, in fact, we have already uh, allocated that money. To that point, I think it'd be hard enough for her to come in to really understand when we have staff here that have been working through this daily. So I'm gonna, I am gonna—I want to give her flexibility, but we also have current staff that understand the need. So to Jeanette's to point, I would rather <coughs> fill it sooner than later. I think filling it sooner would also <laughs> enable our administrative team to have a little bit more time to spend with her to get her up to speed on how things are going in their individual schools because it will free up some of their time. And there's still contingency there. So I mean, there is flexibility, it's just less flexibility, mm -hmm. right? And Dr. Taylor's gonna try to find us more okay. flexibility <laughs> for that 52,000. <laughs> I'm gonna hold you to that before you that You've got title, yeah, the, the area that I'm worried about is elementary. You've got Title II funds that will support one teacher at the K-2 level. You, the 120 was enough to at least get two more uh, so our task right now and is to find the 100 or find the 67 five to put the student advocate back in there. That's where we have some CNI overrun money, um, and both Dan and uh, Dr. Jones are looking for the rest of that. Put some fluidity to this. Chris is nervous about it, but I'm not as nervous about trying to to replace that 67.5 so that that contingency at the, at the bottom will be in that 120 range. The, the, excuse me, you, you just said that you're talking about a bunch of numbers that it's going to be back up to the 120 level? Yeah, Where? I said that earlier. We be, have again, CNI. We have CNI is what? Well, Explain we'll to the community where, what sure. CNI is. It's curriculum and instruction. Okay. That's Dr. Ross's budget. And she's got she's money supporting that she can it just to reach in and just pull No, it it's an overrun. Yes, she okay. has her budget already set for next year. There's a possibility we could get anywhere from thirty to forty thousand dollars out of that if she doesn't use it for something else. She's volunteered that money. She is the one that volunteered the ability to change her role from associate to a director. If that would also help the budget, it was my decision not to make that and leave it in there. Sure. So yes, I mentioned a little bit earlier we can find the funds to support that sixty-seven five. I just don't know where it's all at right now. Okay. Well. The, when we vote on this, it should be there, Dr. Taylor. Okay. We're, we're going to be charge. passing this you, budget. I gave right. you a budget that's balanced. Yeah. It's in your hands. I understand. Do your thing. I understand. But don't sit here and say, oh, it's going to be back up to 121. It will be up we'll, back up we'll, to 120,000. I will okay. guarantee it. Okay. Well, um, two things. Obviously, I'm not voting for this budget. I'm glad the amendment passed. Thank you very much for the support for that. Um, but I won't be able to support this budget for two, well, three strong reasons. One, I think we promised our incoming superintendent flexibility 
to make some decisions, and we're going against that. We're not giving her that flexibility to make decisions regarding her administrative team. Secondly, this budget only allows that we're voting on tonight $52,000 in a contingency fund, which we would never have done in the time that I've served on this, this school board. I would correct you on that. Um, we didn't have a contingency last year. And or the year before that? None. This is our effort to try and build that back up so that we know what's going to happen in the fall. Every nickel was accounted for last year. I'm sorry, Director Rosser, but you're wrong on that. Are you finished? Yes. Thank you. Um, lastly, this, our policy under board committees clearly states under audit and budget oversight committee that the committee shall also oversee the budget process to ensure that the deadlines are met and to ensure that the balanced budget proposal is provided to the board for approval. That's the committee's responsibility. That's what our policy says. That doesn't say the superintendent makes that decision. It doesn't say that the CFO makes that decision. It says the committee oversees that and makes that decision. So I hope in the future that we can do that. We could have avoided a lot of this discussion this evening because we would have had more information and been able to start talking about this budget in a much more timely fashion weeks ago. Policy 707.1, the superintendent shall submit a balanced operating budget to the board by May each year or the ensuing fiscal year or for the ensuing fiscal year. I have met my responsibility. I'll be supporting this amended, uh, amended motion. I think we have a really good discussion. Um, I'm happy to keep the, the student advocate in. I'm fully supportive of the assistant elementary principal and uh, keeping the assistant superintendent in, within the budget. So I'll be voting yes. Same here. All right, if the original motion now we are back to, it was moved by Deardorf, seconded by Rosser, and just to clarify, so we have already accepted the amendment to reinstate the student advocate. So now we are, I wanna make sure I'm stating this so that we're all clear, we are voting on the budget and, and the amendment is a part of it which adds the 67,500 back in as a, a line item. So all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Nay. Passes 5-1. Item 17, reappointment of teaching staff. I move the certified staff appearing on the attached lists be reappointed for the 2018-2019 school year. Second. Moved by Perez, seconded by Rosser. Discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Passes 6-0. Open enrollment applications. I move the board approve the open enrollment request for the 2000. 17-18 and 2018-19 school years as presented. Second. Moved by Bankin, seconded by Perez. Discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Passes 6-0. Item 19. I move the <coughs> board approve the resolution directing the advertisement for sale of not to exceed five million obligation obligation bonds, series 2018 approving electronic bidding procedures and approving official statement. Second. Second. Moved by Rosser, seconded by Bankin. Discussion. Chris, do you want to give a one minute review of what we're m voting on here? I, you <laughs> this this is a continuation of the process that we started at the last meeting, well, actually, the meeting um, on April 9th, I should say, um, before the budget was approved. Um, after the successful vote, um, we um, presented to you a, mo a resolution to allow for a pre-levy of... Um, so that we can levy for bonds to be issued yet this year, and we've levied for them in the fiscal year 18-19 um, budget. So we approved, we knew the, the, res the referendum had passed, we knew we were gonna issue bonds this year, so we went ahead and levied enough to service $5 million in debt, additional debt, um, and uh, we need to issue bonds because I'm already paying um, architects, 
um, construction managers, we've got travel expenses to go visit high schools. Um, I can't have the capital projects fund, which in my role is fund 31, be negative at the end of the year. So I have to issue bonds prior to June 30th so that um, we have a positive balance. This should get us through next spring before we have to issue bonds again. So this is just the very first. We wouldn't normally issue one this small, but there's rules on how fast you have to spend the money. So we don't want to issue too fast before the building gets designed. Great. Thank you for that. Any questions for Chris? Seeing none, uh, this is a roll call vote. So it's been moved and seconded. And I'll go on roll call. Perez, aye. Binken, aye. Deardorff, aye. Franzen, aye. Foster, aye. Colton, aye. Passes 6-0. Item 20, updated bond council services. I move the board approve an updated letter of agreement with Ehlers and Cooney PC to serve as bond council for the issuance of GO bonds, including disclosure services for the new high school and elementary expansion project. Second. Moved by Perez, seconded by Bankin. Discussion? Do you want to clarify? You can give. We brought this to you in February for um, Allers to serve as bond council. Um, after the um, referendum passed, we realized that that um, didn't include disclosure services, which is um, becoming more and more prevalent in what we have to do. I had um, several um, conference calls last week um, making sure that we had answered all disclosure um, questions that we have to present to the IRS. So this just adds the disclosure services for allers to service that. Thank you, Chris. Questions? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Passes 6-0. Item 21. I move the board approve the arbitrage rebate calculation agreement with Barron's Tate Consulting Group for the pre-levy bonds that have been held in escrow. Second. Moved by Bank and seconded by Perez. Discussion? So this one, this one caught me up by surprise as well. So when we issued the $55 million worth of um, elementary bonds, we had contracted with Barron Tate to make sure that we followed or that we had not violated the arbitrage rules on the bonds because as I said, when you issue bonds, you have to spend those proceeds within 24 months. You can't earn interest on those bonds at more than what the, the interest um, rate of the bonds are. There's all these arbitrage rules. So I had worked with Baron Tates at that point. Karen had already contracted with them. I presented all the information. Um, after we did the pre-levy this year, now remember this was the fourth year we had done a pre-levy on our, our elementary bonds. Um, I got a call from Chris at Baron Tates and said, hey, did you see the email from Ron that said we need to work on the um, arbitrage rebate calculation that you just did on your pre-levies? And I went, yeah, I saw that, but what makes this different than any other of the pre-levies I've done? And he says, oh, you've done other pre-levies? So this is something new that the IRS has been requiring. Um, Beth Grobe at Allers had been using Baron Tates to do it for her districts that do pre-levy. Um, and we hadn't done it under Ron Peeler. So not only is he doing the calculation for the bonds for that we just pre-levied this spring, he will go back and do the previous three years um, to make sure that we're in. It was all within the paying agent that they could not, they had to invest it in, in government slugs that those rates couldn't be more than the original rates of the bonds. I'm sure we'll be in compliance, but we are going to go back to all the pre-levies. Isn't my life interesting? <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Moved by Bankin, seconded by Perez. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Passes 6-0. Item 22. I move the board direct the board secretary to publish the proposed budget amendment and to set the date and time for public hearing for May 21st, 2018 at 6.30 p.m. or when the board meets that evening. Because we might not meet right at 6.30. 6.30 p.m. Is that going to be okay? I will... I sent this to the paper already, so I'll see if they can change it. It's supposed to be on Thursday. What time? We think it's going to be 7 o'clock now? Uh, we, we, could, we could do it beforehand, though, right? We could do the, work, the public hearing and then go to work session. 
Yeah, can we do the public hearing as a part of a work session? How does that seem like that would be right? The, okay, so the public hearing, yes, you can because it's not an action item. This board has typically followed the public hearing with the actual action. If you remember in, in, with the budget, we didn't do that because of the resolutions we had to pass on the bonds. We moved that down. So we could have the, the public, we could have the public hearing. I'm thinking if you're going to start the meeting at 7, it's best for me just to call the paper and have them change that time. Let's to uh, 7 o'clock. To have the motion. Okay. Doctor, and if something or, were to happen and we, the, the meeting doesn't start until 7.15 or 7.30, are we okay? Or does it have to be? It's supposed to be as close to the published time as possible for those who might want to be here to make um, comments. I'm more comfortable with 15 minutes versus an hour. Um, but we still we could approve it at the subsequent meetings. So we could hold a public hearing and not take action until our yeah. actual. So meeting. if we at you, six okay. o'clock have the public hearing, go into the um, forum time with our candidates, and then start our meeting. Right now we think it's seven, but we will have. Yes, we you will could. You okay. could do the public hearing, and we were starting the work session at what time? Six. <clears throat> How time sensitive is this? Could we do this on June fourth? No, we cannot. Um, so it is time sensitive. If, um, we have to, if you are going to amend the budget, um, okay, well, yeah, there's the caveats in this. So if you are going to amend the budget, that budget has, amendment has to be adopted and filed with the county auditor on May 31st. If you do it after May 31st and there is a successful petition to appeal the amendment, these, um, it's not the school budget review committee, it's the, um, I used to staff this committee, I'm sorry, I wasn't prepared for this question. There's a committee that's staffed out of the Department of Management that comes and hears protests on budgets and budget amendments, and if they feel they do not have time and it is approved after um, May 31st, they can say your amendment is just void and, yeah. and invalid. So we don't want to do that. So we let's, don't want to do that. <laughs> let's go ahead. If let's make um, it happen my on the suggestion 21st. would be that we amend this to say six o'clock, okay. so that we can do the public hearing, then we can so do the time with the amended to say seven. No. So yeah. if we do the public hearing, because we know six o'clock is the sure thing, we know mm -hmm. that we'll be on target for that okay. time. Then we'll tar start the forum with the candidates for the vac to fill the vacancy, and then we can, because right now we're thinking we will set the board meeting for seven. But if we have multiple candidates, we'll move. To I seven will. Days. I will work so with would, Kim and structure the the board meeting appropriately. I'm not sure we'll call that first section a work session. I think we'll have it as a some other thing within the active meeting, so that. Mm -hmm. we can so that it's out. an actual meeting as opposed to a work session sure. that you're asking. Right. Yep. So okay. I will work but with her to make sure that. 6 o'clock is, is yep. what we should amend this. To. Director well. Russer, are you acceptable for the, your motion? To well, I'm just going to restate it. I was going to say, he didn't, I mean, he didn't finish it. speaking, uh, yeah, so maybe exactly. start over. That's Thanks. why I did. <laughs> didn't. So I am going to start from scratch. I move the board direct the board secretary to publish the proposed budget amendment and to set the time and date of the public hearing for May 21st, 2018 at 6 p.m. Second. Moved by Rosser, seconded by Deerdorf. Discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Passes 6-0. Items from the board. I just wanted a few thank yous. Um, Dr. Ross left, but I just really appreciate everything that she's done over the years to help me grow as a board member and the, the support she's provided our staff. I think it's been very, very influential in our community. So I appreciate that and wish her best in her new role. Uh, secondly, I'd really like to thank our staff, our administrators, for dealing with this budget in a very strategic and meaningful and heartful way. So whether it's our staff here in this building, our building, building principals, they always are looking out for what's best for kids and how to manage our organization. It, it floors me that we have a $60 million budget and we're talking about 
$30,000. And it just saddens me the fact that we're not funded in a way to help us uh, be more effective in how we teach kids. So again, I applaud our staff for being creative and, and working through all options. Uh, um, and then lastly, uh, I always thank our staff for the reappointment. We went through that action quickly. We have, in my opinion, the best staff in the state, and it's great that we can reappoint those at this meeting. Um, I appreciate all their work. She's back now, so now I'm going to talk. You missed a few words. But um, I want to thank you, Dr. Ross. You have been instrumental in helping me learn this role of being a board member serving on teaching and learning uh, initially. And uh, we were provided your uh, letter of resignation, but I want to read a part of it because I want the public to understand. Because as I read it, I'm like, yes, yes, and yes. And there's not a mention of a new facility. And I think sometimes in our work, maybe there is, but I'm not going to read that part. Uh, many times in our work we are approving, how many things tonight did we approve on bond, council, and arbitrage, and everything else, but we don't get the opportunity to talk about what's at the heart of, of this institution and the things that's, that we've done. And I think this speaks to Dr. Rossi and Dr. Taylor. But or, our team has worked hard has worked hard to accomplish a great deal over the past eight years, including the implementation of professional learning communities, initiating board committees that have provided a broader understanding of our work, improved alignment of curriculum and instruction and assessment, and increased, increased professional learning to inform instruct, instruction and leadership. I think as board members we can sit here and think about all of these things have been talked about tonight, whether it was at our meeting we had with the board from United prior to this or at the board table tonight. So I just want the two of you to know how much I really appreciate the time, effort, expertise that you have provided on the things that are really important, and that's providing great experiences for our kids. So thank you very much for your work. Thank you. I appreciate that Luke brought up that we are approving um, our, our staff contracts because it's teacher appreciation time, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I really want to applaud all of our staff that uh, we are in the sprint to the end of the school year and I really appreciate all of our staff and our teachers. Um, I know there's a lot of squirrely kids out of there and you are doing your very best to keep them focused and continue to um, really take advantage of the time and grow before the end of the school year. So thank you to all of our staff for, for everything that you do. Um, the other thing that I wanted to add as, as we look to the future, uh, some of the things that I have been working on board and I'm going to continue to do some research, Harry Hilgenthal and I had a really great conversation about opportunities for supporting Ms. Reisner and some of the transition and, and what some of those opportunities may look like. Um, I had also reached out with Dale Monroe to have some discussions with him because he was our search consultant and to talk about some supports there. So uh, continue to work on that and, and we'll continue to work on that in the future. You, you had talked about her coming early or had working it on that. hasn't been identified no. okay. yet. So we, yeah. So People in the community are asking, sure. when is she coming? Yep. Okay. Yep. okay. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. Okay. So. I have talked to her. Um, she has a place to live, and she is planning on coming, um, but I don't know officially when she's planning on like okay. yeah. starting. She and I have been texting for two weeks, so we're trying to find a time that we can have a real good, good but good. yeah. So, thank you. Anything else from board? Staff? Appreciate those comments. I think if you talk to any of the building principals or administrators, most people think the busiest time of the school year is like the first couple of weeks of school, but I can tell you it's the last four weeks. And it's a dead <laughs> sprint from now until the time that the, the kids leave. Um, but it's still a very exciting time, and very, very busy. As we get into the rest of May and into early June, we'll be bringing a, the graduate list. And remember, commencement is on 2 o'clock on the 27th at Hilton Coliseum, the last day of classes uh, on the 31st. Over the next couple board meetings, we'll be bringing lists, extensive lists for reappointment of staff for the upcoming year. And then as we get into early June, uh, some updates on ELP, ELP, and special ed that will be coming up. Um, I also know that Dr. Ross had two or three things that she was going to uh, update the board on from items from the staff. 
At Friday's curriculum network meeting, um, there was an announcement that the Iowa Department of Education is initiating a dyslexia tax task force. And so they are accepting people who are wishing to apply to be on the task force. And right now, because the notes are a little bit in flux, I should say, um, I don't know who the contact is. I believe it's David Tilly at the Iowa Department of Education. But if we have anyone in the community who is interested in participating, I would be happy to make sure that I get that contact information to them so they can apply directly to the Iowa Department of Education. All right, anything else from the staff? <coughs> All right, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. Second. Moved by Perez, seconded by Deardorff. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Passes 6-0. We will take an eight minute break and reconvene <laughs> at 9.05. Yeah. Thank you. Not a minute longer. How's that? <laughs>